All right, good evening, everybody, and for those folks uh, listening and watching at home, uh, tonight is the planning board meeting for Monday, November 19th. Uh, the chairman is out tonight on a personal matter, so I'll be handling uh, the duties uh, in front of us. Uh, the first order of business tonight is miscellaneous business, uh, and it's regarding the trails at Legacy Farms. Uh, I'd like to uh, bring up Peter Bemis, engineering design consultants, to speak to um, erosion and sediment control, specifically as it relates to a breach that was identified uh, in November, um, early November. And there's been some actions taken, uh, and I think it's important for this board and the public to be brought up to speed uh, on those activities. Uh, so I'll, Mr. Bemis, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, ben Gately from Heritage Properties, I'm the developer at the trails, and I'm here with my engineer, Peter Bemis. Um, we had a meeting with conservation last week to give them an update, and we're here tonight to give the same update of our stormwater management efforts and a plan going forward. So, Peter? Good evening. I'm not sure. So the board behind me, I'll, I'll go as far as the mic will carry my voice. Um, so we, we had uh, so we had, we had a mitigation plan for the project. The contractor was um, incorporating that, so the design engineer for the project was Bowler Engineering, as the project plans would be approved. Yeah. And there were a number of plans that just didn't have enough erosion control in place to address the situations that they were dealing with on the site. The contractor implemented some of the programs. Uh, the way Bowler's plans were structured, there were a toolbox, basically. You had to open up a toolbox and figure out which tools to use to address the problems. Uh, some of those problems just got a little bit beyond what the site was capable of handling. So we kept involved and we came up with other plans to implement uh, beyond those points and everything was done. So, so what you see here in red is really the things to address on the site. Um, just flip ahead to what we were able to implement. We went about two weeks to set the time. All of this green is the areas that were stabilized within the site. Um, we've got some off-site locations where we've got stormwater going off in those directions that have uh, treatment cells. So we went from having one staging area to actually having uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary treatment. So instead of the water going off just after one um, cleansing, if you will, one cleansing cell, we have three cleansing cells now to deal with that water. Got it. So, so let me just kind of <clears throat> um, pause there for a second. On the previous map, those areas in red were areas that you identified needed Addressing. to be addressed. Right. And that was part of the site walk or post the site walk, part of the analysis that your group did. Correct. Right. Yeah. And so there's been communications going back and forth. Um, the, the contractor wasn't dealt a very good hand. A lot of construction sites have been undergoing these same problems during the same period of time. I was just sharing with Vin, you know, we always look ahead 10 days in weather. Um, back when I did this a week ago, uh, today and, and uh, tomorrow, it was supposed to be nice sunny days. <laughs> uh, we get rain today, we get snow tomorrow. You know, that's just what we've been dealing with. It seems like every week we were getting two rain events, and in the case of the time when we had a, a release from the site, that was actually a four-inch rainfall that was anticipated to be half of that. So that's really what's been um, the shortcoming for the site, is that it just, we had a lot of open area, there just wasn't enough systems in place to address that. They have been all mitigated at this point. We met with conservation, they're satisfied with that mitigation. That's what I showed you here. Yeah. We still are doing um, the continuing efforts. I do have the other plans that you folks approved, if I hadn't delved into that, but I just, at this point, we're trying to just walk forward. But this is basically what was outlined by the previous uh, designer as to what had to be done. And the contractor did all of these things. They just were not adequate. And so we identified where the inadequacies were, the plan together. The contractor implemented every program. They work long evenings, they work weekends, we just stayed on this. Um, and everything is in place that needs to be there. And we're continuing to work on this. Uh, we're actually going to use the, um, the cold weather we're going to get on Thanksgiving to allow the silt that's in our primary uh, settling basin to freeze in place. And then we're going to excavate out blocks of silt that is going to be frozen uh, so that we can then lie in that basin. Because that was really our biggest problem was we had an area where we had a lot of silt deposited, but when the, the heavy rush of stormwater came in, it would retransport all of that sediment back up again. So even though we had trapped it, it was getting resuspended and then transferred off. So I understand the work that your group has done. 
and I appreciate that. I kind of take a few steps back in terms of how was this missed on the front end? I thought you and, might want that because Georgia had mentioned that it might come up. <laughs> <laughs> right, so, am I, and I, and I, and I, and I, there was a design plan that was approved, okay, that, that, that the, you know, the developer came forward, hired an engineer to come forward, design the project. There, there's, there's a lot of tools there, they're just not enough for the site to, to handle. So we had to come in and, and do some, uh, some other plans. And again, it, with all due respect to the previous designer, had we not had you know, two, three, four rainfall events coming consecutively, everything probably would have been okay. But this has just not been the normal fall. I'll open it up to members of the, to the board. Through the chair, though, I mean, I mean, from a design perspective, this hasn't, I mean, I know this has been an unusual event, but this isn't like a 100-year storm or something. I, I guess I, I kind of share chair's perspective that it just makes me, I guess, question a little bit um, given the, the design requirements that we put in place to prevent these things from happening, um, the weather we've had hasn't has not been such a substantial event that these kinds of things should be should be failing. So Understood. that's and I realize that it wasn't your design, but I guess I'd be curious to hear from you as to specifically what the shortcomings were of the design, so that at the least that we could be educated so that as we're Agreed. reviewing future proposals that maybe right. we can ask some, some better questions. Well, the, the, the one thing for, clearly from our perspective was that there's a 30 inch drain pipe that's supposed to be carrying existing water through the project site. That had a direct discharge to wetlands with, with no mitigation whatsoever in, in front of it. So, so basically that was supposed to just be a pass through pipe. But unfortunately during construction, you're going to get some areas where you're going to get water coming into that system that hasn't been treated yet. So that, that had to be brought offline. So that's why we created a separate cell for that individually. It wasn't even called for in the design plan. Um, the, uh, the detention basin here has been constructed. It's in place. It's functioning. But um, again, unfortunately, it's just getting inundation of, of, of water after repetitive events where it just wasn't able to be fully stabilized. Um, so, so again, it was done properly, it was done in accordance with the plan. We it just were, were not, um, not enough consecutive days of good dry weather for certain stabilization uh, techniques to take hold. Even though they were seeded, they still they didn't fully uh, develop, if you will. So, so just one follow up question yeah. is, this, is this fairly new that this was, this retention system was built? I mean, I guess, I'll, I, are you uh, referring to the. Done, this was done back in July and August. Okay, so it was in place in plenty of time to be receiving water this time of year. Uh, it's just not, again, there are portions of this that weren't 100% stabilized. They are now, we've reinforced them with riprap. Mm -hmm. um, the technique was proposed by the design plan to be all along the sea, open basin, but we had to change that to address the problem that was there. So um, at this point, I, as I said, the, the water quality leaving the site now is good. We just had one very bad rainfall event that the site just couldn't address, and that's when the release happened, and we've addressed it. Got it. Any Thank questions? You. Yes, ma'am. Um, for one thing, um, if the seeding was done on that, that particular um, basin that you were talking about in July or August, it should have been pretty well established, wouldn't you say? I and would. Would that be normal? That yeah. would be normal. So, um, but again, okay. in August we started having rainfall events that mm -hmm. were just very high frequency in September, particularly, and it's just it's caused some of those areas to wash out. Okay, the green is that hydro mulch? Is that the That's correct, correct term? That's what okay. we've done. Yeah. So the hydro mulch um, at this time of year, obviously, a lot has been put down on the mm -hmm. on the diagram as well as on the pictures here. Um, at this time of year, that's not going to you know, seed. It's not going to you right. know, take root or anything like that. How effective is that? Uh, th this is going to stay in place uh, through that winter period. Come spring, uh, it will hold through that period, and then we do plan on covering this area. So in your experience, that, that kind of mulch will hold through the winter? It, 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 we are going to go back out and take care of it as needed. Okay. The intent is for it to do so, yes. Yeah, about how often do you have to check on that? Uh, well, we'll, be going, we'll be going back out. Like next week, the temperature is supposed to rise again, yeah. so we'll be able to apply more. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's uh, obviously this time of year, I would think that you're going to have to do a lot of maintenance on that right. to make no, sure it doesn't reoccur. And, and the, the other key is just to get, to get asphalt down. Again, the, the asphalt work was, I think they started scheduling that at the yeah. beginning of this month. 
I mean, mm -hmm. here we are at the end of the month, and we still have not got down any asphalt mm -hmm. because, again, the periods of rain. Uh, is that there was reference in the um, the notes yep. to a winter preparation plan that was supposed to be done by the beginning of November? Is that what you're referencing? About a week. So they, they they were implementing one, but they were just off. They were off on schedule. On schedule so because of the rain. We had it done within the first week. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and what, yeah. Weather just, I have to say that I've been doing this for a long time. I got the gray hair to show it, the white hair to show it, and this has just been a very unusual year. Extremely yeah. unusual. Yeah. We've been, it's, all, it's been about, excuse me, uh, for almost a month now, we've been five <coughs> dry days away from paving, putting our binder down on half of our uh, road area for phase one. About 700 feet of the 1400 feet. And had we been able to get that down, that would have changed uh, the way the water's been diverted. And we just you know, haven't been able to catch a break. And we were doing fine up until I think it was two weeks ago mm -hmm. on a Saturday. We had a three to four inch rain event. And the twice a week, two inch rainstorms, we were managing. Um, it was just that four inch one after the, you know, just frequency of the prior ones and the saturation that I think led to the situation that we had. Um, you know, I, not that this is an excuse, but I think our response was terrific um, under the circumstances and uh, we we found things that were not our doing. It was a culvert down on, uh, was it Tower Street? Or? Right. Yeah, there's yeah. some off-site improvements that were, were, were done that we, mm -hmm. uh, we, we t our water ties into. Um, but probably the most important thing is the catch basins for this whole site are in. The drain manholes, everything is in, but they're not online. They're plated. They're yeah. low gravel yeah. because we're anticipating putting down the asphalt, bringing them up to grade. And then being and, able to so we're, we're, get it. So we're at a disadvantage because all that surface water now is then getting directed over some of the other denuded areas. And, and so now you're creating gullies. Instead of having rills, you have gullies and you have channels. Understood. And so that's what we've really had to address. And the okay. mitigation measures have been put in place. There are a number of you know, photos that I could share with you that how the, that it went sequentially to address those problems. But I, all I can say is right now we have done that. Okay. And I'm sorry we're getting to you to recap, but that's that's really where we're at. Yeah, I've got a couple of final thoughts, but David, do you have a question? And well, we have I just to wanted to, um, <coughs> on our side of the house, like, did we get a response from Beta? I know this looks like it was reported from somebody from the trails. Uh, I didn't see any notes from, 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 from Beta on this. You have not said you're the more I'm sorry, sir. Bob Lamoureux, Lamoureux. Oh, yes. Lamoureux. Yes. And yeah. Phil, um, Paradise. Paradise, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that might be a, maybe at the next meeting if we could have um, Phil be able to kind of just kind of weigh in on this. I guess two questions, two final thoughts is, are you going to be able to get any of that uh, asphalt down this year? Yes, actually, I thought today was actually going to be another day to prep for paving tomorrow. So again, it will depend on what happens tonight, but the paving crew is scheduled to be there tomorrow to actually get our first driveway paved. Okay. Uh, so right. it, it's going to happen. I'm, I'm just going to show you there is enough good days still ahead of us. Um, they are projecting the temperatures to be moderate for November, December, next week, and the <coughs> following week, so we'll, we'll see. Like I said, I, I use these charts to try to help me plan too, and uh, they don't always work. Pretty much, every, I would say at least twice a week, we had memos going off, uh, outlining where we were in the process with this, mm -hmm. and sometimes they were daily. Well, and, I, and I do appreciate um, you know, the effort and work you guys have put in. Clearly, there's been a lot of work done to address and mitigate this. Um, you know, and if this holds, it's, it's all well and good. I, I am curious, I think, to the points here around beta and going forward. And then are there, is there future risk? You know, understand you can't control for the weather, but is there any other area that uh, poses a potential um, threat or risk? Yeah, we're not going to open up other sections of the site now that we know how this, this site reacts. 
Okay. Um, but then again, from the designer's perspective, it did go through peer review, yeah. um, and a peer review engineer did look at this and did deem it acceptable. And in retrospect, when we look back and saw where the problems were, you know, here, here we are coming in with like the third peer review, if you will, and we're sure. redesigning to, to address that. Uh, I would say that as we go forward, we're definitely going to be addressing those areas differently. Uh, the design may still be the same in that that's where the treatment system is going to be yeah. for the overall project, but there will be interim steps to get to that point. Sure. Becomes, so you that. becomes a lesson. We're excited about the project. I, I Actually, when I go up there with Vin, I, I keep looking over at that reservoir and I, I say, Vin, this is a really nice looking project. There's going to be a lot of proud homeowners here. They're going to have a nice view of that lake. Right. Well, thank you. Final comments or questions, and then we'll... I just wanted to note for the public who hadn't read the packet, it looks like they're going to go back before the Conservation Commission at the end of the month. Or next yes, week. we will update the, them again. That's correct. And then the Ashton Conservation Commission, you're going to go before them, too. And the Board of Health is going to do some testing for pesticides. That's okay. correct, yes. So, okay. well, that was a new one for us because the order didn't explain that, but because the was sediment released, they had asked us to do that, so we are working for that. Final comments quickly before the talked um, briefly about um, an off an off site culvert house street. Um, um, so, 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 we, yeah, yeah. so we when I went down for my first inspection in that area, I actually mm -hmm. found the culvert three quarters full of sediment that we didn't come from our project because our sediment is basically the color of light coffee. And this sediment was basically all organics that had come from the work that was done along House Street. Because uh, we were not releasing anything in that, that type of material. Mm -hmm. So I had reached out to Mr. Gately and said, look, as, as a good faith, good you know, maintenance project going forward here, let's just start by cleaning the entire system from bottom up. So we cleaned those culverts uh, down on House Street and uh, Wilson Street is actually the section that was most uh, egregious was on Wilson Street. And um, is there any kind of regulation where you will frequently test the water drainage going off site? And are there locations that you could point to us where those, that water is coming, is going? Uh, I can show you on the plan where it's going, but as far as the testing, I, I would hope that when we do this for this baseline, that we probably wouldn't have to do it again because this portion of the site I don't believe was. Um, it had been identified as an area that did need testing, but because there was a release, the Board of Health had asked, would we please you know, go off and do that? So we are preparing to do that. So we need to have a third party go out to take the samples and then bring them to the lab. As far as the pathway, I use the other plans, it goes out far. Uh, this is Wilson and, and, and how basically, so the, uh, the Ashland treatment plant would be up here, off sheet. So basically the stormwater goes, goes off the site uh, down this uh, wetland system. And there's some channels that go along the driveway to the um, treatment plant. This is part of the Ashland treatment plant land in Hopkinton, but part of the treatment plant. So water comes down here, water comes here, and water comes down here. Um, the culvert system is transferring some of this water goes directly across to the, um, the reservoir. And then the other water comes down along uh, Wilson Street and then crosses over right in front of the treatment plant. And that's particularly the culvert was, was uh, full of sediment. Um, and then that goes across and discharges into the All right. It's kind time. Yeah, I'm supposed to do that. Sorry. That's okay. But thank you for, um, thank you for the, the update. Katie, do you have one comment on this in particular? Or is it um, uh, regarding what they've done here? Is your comment regarding or pertinent to the work that they've done here on the um, for the trails. Yes, sir. Okay. Come on in. I'll give you a second just to make your comment. Can I give you a few seconds? A few seconds. One minute. Just, one I'll just make your comment on it, please, and then we'll and then we can kind of move on. But yes? Yeah, Katie Towner, nine Kruger Road. So um, you know, this is not an abnormal event. This is the new normal. Um, the, I, I walk that street every day, and, and there has been water coming down every day um, since last spring. So this is not an unusual event. The, the uh, water event that you're talking about not only impacted the side that you're talking about, it also continues to impact Wilson Street at Kruger. So what the... Um, 
construction plan to date has accomplished is they've created a huge increase in impervious ground and that has increased the flow of water towards Wilson Street, which is now even more saturated. I walk that as well. And the water doesn't go into the ground because it's just, it's just scraped flat with dirt, right? So the water comes down and um, it, it seeps through the little remaining ground that there is, which, which does not drain as described because the no test pits were dug to determine the drainage, right? So they should, they should go back and figure out, like you said, you know, what's causing this? It's not just, oh, we had an unusual <coughs> event. It's, okay. because the, it's because they, did not, they relied on satellite data for the type of ground that's there and they did not do the proper test pit to determine that the ground drains. So now we've got an even worse situation <coughs> on Wilson Street and we have water seeping out from the trails into the Wilson Street and freezing. Okay. So nothing has happened I, except the situation has gotten worse. And, got it. And got it. your consultant should not just be looking at the other side of the project, they ought to be looking at the entire impact. And we're going to have Beta come in and talk about that. So Katie, thank you for that. I appreciate your point. We're going to have Beta come in and speak to that as well. Thank you very much. Can I just have one more comment to that? When we ask Beta to do that, we should, I think it'd be worth doing a postmortem on all that site work, because it seems like we've had a number of stormwater issues um, on that site that, you know, that were designs have, have failed. Yep. Um, I just think it'd be interesting to have them go back and assess all of that stormwater management because it seems like there's been a lot more documents, informal documents, because there have been multiple design failures. All right. And I, I might okay. add something too that um, they say they're going to be testing for a baseline at this week. I, I, I would, I would um, push for a baseline sort of uh, for, for more testing, sort of towards the end of the project at the beginning okay. of winter, um, at the end of winter. So that we can Let, have. Let's do that with beta when, okay. when Phil comes in here and do that. So uh, I want to get back on track here if I can. Uh, the second um, article here to discuss is the continuing public hearing, 18 Cedar Street, off street parking special permit application. And it looks like they've um, requested for continuance to December 3rd. Right. So <clears throat> do we need to, I don't think I need to make a motion on anything. We can just. I need to open the public hearing for this. Open and close. Open and close it, right? Do we so. open it? I just vote to continue the hearing okay. to December 3rd at 9. 8.30? All right, so I'll entertain December. a motion. December 3rd. All right, December 3rd at 8.30. Um, any discussion? All those in favor? I opposed, abstain, so be it. December 3rd, 8.30 for 18 Cedar Street. The third article is continued public hearing, Whisper Way, definitive subplan, subplan application. Mr. Nation and team, we need to open the public hearing. So moved. So moved. Second. Second, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, for the public's benefit, uh, this is a continued public hearing on Whisper Way. Um, the applicant has uh, come a number of times in front of the board. They submitted, um, or resubmitted, I should say, uh, an updated plan. Um, uh, it was received on November 2nd. Um, we just received Beta's comments on Friday, so that's post our typical meeting deadline, so I'm not sure that everybody has had an opportunity to review um, those, those materials, but uh, I will give the applicant uh, an opportunity to kind of speak to the changes that they made or the updates they made to the plan. Um, and Ron, probably really kind of maybe focus on the changes from the original plan that was submitted. 
because right? it's gone. The original plans, beta's made comments back, and now this is the resubmittal post that. Okay. So okay. I think we'll start there, and then I'm sure it'll go a couple of different places. So, you know, we've been we've been bouncing back and forth, and uh, you know, a lot a lot of it, a little bit of it's been from from Concom. You know, where we go to Concom and they're looking for, or our consultant is is looking for for less square footage uh, impact on the wetlands, mm -hmm. and um, so so we'll make a modification for that. And so it's all evolved now, I believe, to hopefully the final version. Um, and you know some of the changes were we we brought them to your attention like the entrance the last time we we're here was a, the 40 foot layout versus the 50 foot layout and but the 40 foot layout is just the same as the rest of the subdivision it's just that there's a 50 foot layout the existing whisper way is a 50 foot layout so my thoughts were to not even bring it up and just let the consulting engineer bring it up and say, oh, by the way, this, they've shifted it off to one side of the layout. And, I mean, but we talked about that for a long time. And maybe, I would, you know, we should have done a better diagram, you know, the colors and, you know, and uh, so uh, that's that one. And uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to think, what, what else do we do? We move the road. We added the crossings for the animals underneath the crossings, road. Crossings, yeah, we've done critter crossings, which that impacts the, the drainage in some manner. It, maybe it relocates a catch basin, and then that affects something else. And so every time we touch something, it, you know, it, it keeps going. So um, I think, oh, and the sidewalk was another kind of thing that we came back on and and we still uh, we still have a I guess a hard time with the sidewalk down there we know you you want it um, and we're willing to do whatever you want mm -hmm. so we're just gonna gonna make that work hopefully that what we've proposed will will be okay with DPW I don't see why it wouldn't and um, I guess one thing that come came to mind to me today was if if uh, Mass Highway has a problem with it mm -hmm. What do we do? You know, where do we go? We we back in with you guys for you know another <laughs> another issue. But, um, Definitely something to address it um, at the approval process as far as conditioning and things like that. Because if Mass Highway does have an issue with the sidewalk out on Wood Street, yeah. we would have to come back to you for a modification of the subdivision. So that's just going to be in the verbiage as far as how that goes. To be able to do that. Yeah. So. That can be done. Okay. So I have a question. Why Mass DOT uh, has involvement in this? It's a, it's a local road. It's not a state road. It's Route 135. It's a numbered route, but it's not a state road. Um, so they don't have... I don't believe they do. No. We won't need a Mass Highway curb no. or anything like that. That's a good thing to know. Well, that makes that a lot easier. Yeah, maybe that's why they don't call us back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just on my own education, Elaine, is that where you see the signs that the town highway, I mean, uh, state highway begins and state highway ends? Is right, that so area of there are no state roads in Hopkinton other than the highway, than the major okay. highways. Thanks. So, I don't know, Dan, do you want to, do you want to follow down the list here? Or? Yeah, one of the things that, uh, speaking with Georgia, was that she wanted to go through the uh, outline basically that we have to address some of the items that mm -hmm. we have out there for a detailed discussion. Uh, yes. Um, so that we're meeting with Beta tomorrow uh, at 10 o'clock to go over their letter and to try to address everything there so that we can, we can put that to rest and then all that would be left would be what's on the outline. Yeah, I think just looking at, I don't know if you have a question, I just have a comment. Uh, I do sort of have a question. Please. I was wondering, you just, Sort of walks through the entire plan. Yeah. That you've been in a number of times and it's been sort of piecemeal. Right. <coughs> very interested to know where the 25% slopes are and some other things and just an overview of okay. the whole. Well, as far as the 25% slopes, I don't have that on this plan. <coughs> the one place that we're crossing it with the road is right through here. Um, <coughs> in this, this corner here, 
is basically a very sharp ledge trough. Um, and the whole reason that we had shifted the road um, to the south this far over and not maintain the, the buffer that the, the town asked for, for requests is to be able to get off of that really steep area and we're into this is the shallowest area to be able to maintain the uh, continuity of the road to get all the way out. Uh, everything through here, the contours are very, very, it's basically a 20 foot drop. So that's why this is also the back line of the lots. The houses are up to the front, up to the front, away from that to be able to get the, uh, the largest yards. The other areas, there's some areas up in here, um, in some of the open space. Uh, I'm just going from memory right now. If, if you shorten the depth of that U, would you avoid the 25 no. no, it's a ridge that runs right through. If you look at the contours, they, they run right through here. And this is there's an existing car path that kind of follows right through here. So that's basically where we follow right through the trail. And then you also have large slopes over by the highway, is that correct? Mm. There are sharp slopes over in here. Um, not where the roadway is going. There's a rock uh, right in here behind the detention pond. But the, uh, the road is basically, it follows one of the car paths that goes through there. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to interrupt with my yep. specific questions. I was looking no, just kind of for a, right. an overview of um, the whole project in its right. entirety. This is the existing whisper way that comes through, and the turnaround right here is for the gravel, for the, uh, the hall property. Mm -hmm. um, the existing right way is 50 feet that comes through, and then there's a paper turnaround right here at the end. So we're maintaining this right away, and then from here we're extending through and out. Um, there's going to be town water, fire hydrants every 500 feet. The sewer is going to be collected in a gravity system that runs from a high point right in front of these houses. It'll run gravity down, collecting sewage from these houses. It runs cross country through here and down. These houses also run gravity from this area to down to here. There's a, uh, it's um, three large tanks, pump chambers, that pump back up along the edge of the road into this area, which is a septic system. Um, it's an oak wood um, drip system. And what we've done is, or uh, Clearwater Environmental, they've designed this. It runs with the contours so that it's only, I believe, about a foot below the surface and just pumps up and then displaces the concrete uh, through, through, uh, through uh, gravity. It's going to be going to Board of Health for approval. She, Liz Dupree with Clearwater, has had conversations with the Board of Health about this. Um, it just, once we get through the planning board stage, she'll submit and we're fairly confident we'll have an approval through that. Uh, Stormwater is collected in there's four basins, one small stilling basin, settling basin that acts as a level spreader. Uh, it goes through a catch basin manhole system, reinforced concrete pipe, HPM pipe, and then through here into this area. This is the largest of the basins. Uh, we had to move this level spreader over to be able to shift it over so that keep everything out of the 50 foot buffer for um, uh, wetlands. There's a vernal pool that runs through here, a vernal pool right here, also a vernal pool up in here. So we're contained, constrained with the uh, location that we can put a lot of the stormwater. This originally was a larger basin, and then this had to get shrunk up because of the discovery of this pool. 
And I think we're going to go through some of that in the outline, right, with the stormwater piece, and there's other yeah, elements yeah, yeah. That, that, that we're going to do as well. So, um, 24 lots, they all are at least 30,000 square feet. wetland replication area up in here to accommodate for fill here, wetland fill here, and a little bit right in this area here. These are already existing, uh, there's already pipes in these locations, so we know you're moving and replacing, increasing the diameter and uh, capacity to meet current stormwater management. So, does that help a little bit, Carol? Provide an outline? Yeah. yeah. There's elements on the uh, public hearing outline that we started to go through at the last meeting. Um, Ron, I don't know if you had some additional comments, but my plan here was to kind of pick up where we left off and work through these outstanding issues one by one. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then kind of work through, unless you had some, some other <coughs> comments to, oh, to, oh. to jump on. Um, through the chair real quick, just for, the, for HCAM, I don't know if, if the TV in the back is working, but for the people that are in the audience, they can't see the chart. Do you know? Oh, it, it, I can you see it? Oh. Can you do that? It's Does close. this control anything? Not without the screen. Sorry, I just... It's good. I, just, I wasn't even... Realized that nobody can see this except for... <coughs> That's correct. Okay. I have that. It's on page 45 on, on, our, on our chart. Um, <clears throat> so working through the elements on the outline, uh, the next open one is a detailed discussion uh, on the outline itself. And the first element there are road and lot uh, layout design. So if you just want to kind of go through, um, and you were kind of touching on it right mm -hmm. earlier, um, you know, speak to how you've kind of constructed the, the lot layout, you know, taking into account wetlands and, and the things that you've done from, from that perspective. Um, well, well, we started out with, um, we started out with, Wisp, with the existing Whisper Way. And, um, and then, and we, and, and we tried to do something that, that would come back out on Whisper Way. And, and that didn't work because it doesn't fit with the, with the rules and regs. So we had to come out, we had, we had to have two ways in and out of the place. So we had to <coughs> loop around um, to the old Wood Street, which is currently the driveway of 129 Wood Street. Mm -hmm. So that was where Wood Street was located before 495. Um, and there's a, so the, in, in this area, in the area, of that 129 Wood Street, it's right up, it's right up in here. Um, there's an existing house uh, right about here, and um, there's a there's a cart path, farmer's cart path that, that goes runs across the outlet to the Vernal Pool, which is right here. So uh, that was just a natural place for us to to go through. It's an existing cart path. There's actually a there's actually a car up in the up in the woods there at the end of it. So, um, so that's where we really got, we tried another loop. We, we had another, like there was one thing that was a, it, was, it came around, it came, and it came back, and it went back out the same entrance, and we, we, had, we had tried a double barrel road. And um, that had more, so, that, so that's a, a double wetland crossing is what it made, so it just, Nothing really worked, and then it's, it's questionable whether that works for two roads in and out. So, so we ended up with this, and um, and the lots just pretty much came and followed along. Some of the lots are there are three, four existing lots. One of them up by 495, which is 129 Wood Street. That's that's going that building gets raised, and um, the other three houses 
um, may come down, may not come down. I think one of them, at least one of them, absolutely will. But um, the other two, who knows? Because I thought that a total of 24, 22 are new, and then two of the four existing are going to stay. Is that still the plan? Or? Um, 24, I think so. I think there are actually 21 new lots. Okay. And then think. three would stay, and yeah. potentially? Yeah. Uh, um, no, you're <coughs> probably right, friend. 22 and yeah. 22. And two. 22 and 2. Okay. Question? Chair, question about lots. Um, how many of the lots are under the minimum lot requirement size? None. None of them are. So, so I guess just reading the comment, however, it does not comply with minimum lot area. Am I reading that wrong? I think that would have been an update to the plan. Yeah, that may have been a, an earlier plan, and there may have, I don't know, I, I vaguely recall that. There was a uh, zoning article 3. Right. Okay. Right. The, all the lots are smaller than a conventional subdivision requirement, but it, they meet for the open space. So, sorry, so it's creating, okay, 26.2 acres of open space out of the 39. Got it. So then that's 13 acres for 24 lots at 30,000 at least. Hmm. To go back to the lots, is there are 24 lots total Three of the lots will remain. They'll they're reconfigured somewhat, but okay. So the four, the there's another lot that the house, the building gets raised. One twenty nine. One twenty nine. So so just to, I'm sorry, I'm just sorry. checking my math here. So twenty four lots yep. that are all at least thirty thousand square feet. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So and that's consuming thirteen of the thirty nine acres. It's 39 uh, acres in total, and 26.2 yeah, are going to be open space. Yeah, there's 40, I think 47 acres. With 47 total, okay. I believe so. It's high 40s. All right. You good on the, on the road? I'm good on the map. Sorry, I just, just no, wanted it's to make good. sure I was. Uh, just straight up. Any other questions from members of the board on road and lot layout design? I think this might be applicable to that. Yes. Um, I'm wondering if there's um, any parking, um, and I believe you've said this before way, way long ago, <laughs> um, for the trailhead, you know, basically near the existing turnaround for Whisper Way, is there, there's a trailhead there for the halt lane, there right? There is, yes, so. yeah. And so the trailhead, and we discovered this, I think probably the very first meeting was that um, they don't want anything done to the, to the trailhead. They don't want it. That made larger. They're, okay. They're happy with it the way it is. So we're going to just do that, just just that. Okay. They want it to be gravel. They want it to okay. be unaltered. And it's also a conservation restriction, which is probably pushes that. Yeah. We are adding a couple of, uh, an area where you can park two horse trailer. Yeah, at the other end. Rigs, yeah. yeah. Over this area. Yeah. So. This, this area, or the, the, the trailhead, um, a majority of that is actually off the property. It's uh, we're going to maintain an entrance here, like a driveway apron, so that you can you can drive into it. There won't be a there won't be a curb there, but there'll be a it'll be a little bit raised just to keep the water on the road. But it'll be like a normal driveway that you okay you know, like a, yeah. you'd pull into your. But there's like a space for a, a car or two, you know. Oh, that, yeah. It's going to stay the exact same way it okay. is. It's just. Because a majority of this area is not on, right? Not on this property that we're dealing with right now. Okay, here. got it. It's actually off the property. There's only a small section, a couple of, right. maybe a couple of hundred square feet. I, I think you can easily, well, how about easily? But you, if if people park sensibly, you can, I think you can fit at least six cars in there. Oh, okay. We were at, uh, we had one site block. I forget it was planning. I think it was planning yeah. back the. Um, open space stage, I mean at the uh, special permit. <coughs> I think everybody parked there. Okay. 
except for maybe one truck parked across the yeah, street. Yeah, I remember. Okay. Yeah. And then the signs at the begin at the at the entrance to Whisper Way, the the brown ones with the yellow writing for the trails. Yeah. That that'll just stay there, right? right. So that's yeah. Okay. Or, Got it. Or put in a better location, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. More visible. Okay. Good. Sorry, sorry. Just to go back, I'm wondering if you can confirm the overall size of the project and the amount of open space it's creating, because it says in the document that it's 39.9 acres with 26.2. Which document is it? This is in the, the beta. That's uh, when we got response. on Friday, Friday, right? Uh, November 16th, yeah, from Friday. Yeah. Uh, what page are you on? Yes. Well, page one, it says the 39.9 acre project parcel. Project overview. Project overview. Okay. And then on page two, it says the proposed subdivision plan depicts the recreate, reconstruction and extension of Whisper Way, a total of 3,500 feet of roads, provide access to 22 lots. Two of the existing four homes on the site will remain, and the project will create 26.2 acres of open space. The lots actually, the existing lot is 47 acres, and the, it's in square feet, just give me one second. creating 26.2 acres of open space. 26, one. So the remaining area should be 26. No, 19. It's got to be half, that's right. Yeah. So I guess that's, if, if, as long as it's 47 acres, then that the math adds. It just, right. Right. based that on the documentation I have, it says 39.9. That's something I can, we can discuss that tomorrow with Beta. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think there were a number of things that Beta identified that you guys need to yeah. kind of yeah. come to come to resolution on, and that's probably one of them. All right, any other questions on road and lot design, lot layout design? All right, uh, if nothing else, I'll move on to the next one, traffic. Uh, there's three elements here, um, offsite improvements, Impact on abutters, which is number one. Uh, impact on abutters and any road widening. So I'd be curious in terms of what was netted out to 40 feet or 50 feet. Sidewalks and then pedestrian slash bicycle safety. So why don't we start with the very first one um, on traffic. That would be impact to abutters from any road widening. Um, one of the things that we're doing is we're actually bringing <coughs> Whisper Way within the right of way. In the entrance up here, the existing Whisper Way, the gravel road, is actually on the Hall property. It's yep. not within the right of way. So by doing that, that that's created some of the wetland impacts that we had here, um, where this is eventually going to become a town road with the, you know, anticipated that it'll be taken over for street acceptance at some point. We couldn't leave that off of the, of the property because the town would be essentially doing a land taking at that point if they accept it. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's part of the 50 foot. As far as impacts to the abutters, um, the only abutters are actually the town of Hopkinton. Um, it's surrounded by the town of Hopkinton on all sides except for the state highway layout on the other side. So then there's really no issue from an abutter standpoint at all? There will be no impact to the abutters as far as you know, noise. Or, and then the road widening coming in on the wetland at the at the entrance there. Concom, right. mm -hmm. did they raise issue with that? Are they okay with with that uh, widening to fifty feet? Uh, the the fifty foot is already existing. What we're trying, what we did was we actually shifted the road within that fifty foot to the to the northwest a little bit, just to get it as far. The road's still within the right of way. It's just been shifted a hair to five feet to get it to, to minimize the lessen the impact on the wetlands. Minimize those impacts and still be able to keep all the road construction, the grading, and everything within the right of way. Okay. Any questions from board members on impact to abutters or the road widening? On the road widening, I should say. I don't think anyone here, but if there were abutters here, it would be the time. Uh, yes, it would be the time. Anybody representing the town? <coughs> the, Thank uh, you. So, uh, Donna and 
and Dan McIntyre and Eileen McIntyre live up there, and they're selling the land. So they're kind of not a butter, so they're landowners. So that they're the, really the only people that get impacted, and they're moving <laughs> by this. Um, and they're not here today, are they? No, I don't. Nope. <coughs> right. um, no further questions. I'll move on to the next one. Sidewalks. So maybe just a brief recap of the sidewalks through the site itself, and then I think the elephant in the room is the sidewalk on 135. So the sidewalk, we propose a sidewalk along the inside of the loop, all the way around, all the way, and then, and then we also have a sidewalk, we're showing a sidewalk out on Wood Street. So um, we had originally the last, one of the last versions of the plans, or a couple of versions ago, we had a five foot wide sidewalk and it didn't fit. So we got into this whole thing and that had to be five feet, and now, and then we find out that we can really do four feet. So I think four feet just fits. With the doing the five foot, we actually, it actually forced us into moving the guardrail back and, and two utility poles, and then going back to Hong Kong, looking for more mm -hmm. disturbance. So I think the side, well, the sidewalk works if with four feet, and the back of it being right, up, right just below the drip line of the face of the guardrail. And then we do a, uh, uh, a berm, and then there's, a f it, there's one area where there's only about a foot behind the fog line, but the rest, of it, then, it, then it widens out. It gets to two, and you go further down towards, uh, towards here, and there's plenty of room here to push the sidewalk back, and you, know, you get as much as three or four feet. So, so our, one of the reasons for designing this, this, the trail through the woods was to avoid that, yeah. that wetland. But that one foot difference makes it work. And that's compliant? Four feet versus five feet? Every feet is 88. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then are you going to keep that trail? That I remember that from the one iteration that... We can. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, just, I was just asking. Yeah, um, the uh, ConCom liked it. Yeah, they 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 really thought it was. Yeah. I was surprised. I thought I didn't think they would. <coughs> but um, sure. yeah, a couple of couple. I, I don't think there's much maintenance of it, right? There's no. It's just just the trail. To this the right? Right. Yeah. Just just uh, clipping little little shrubs and you know no trees. Just you know it's going to just meander. And there's one wet spot where you have to go across, and it was just going to be a little boardwalk. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think they're more like something that just lays on the ground. So, um. Um, yeah, it, it, it seems like it's a plus. Um, <laughs> and obviously, the, the discussion that we had in the last meeting where you were here um, about that being um, uh, more accessible, um, ADA compliant, wouldn't be a factor if we have the, the sidewalk on Wood right. Street. So, so it would just be a nice little trail. So. It seems like it kind of meets the general Idea. You know, cri idea, not criteria, the idea of having a sidewalk that kind of create, completes the loop, but then also having that trail is kind of neat. I think yeah. If, yeah. I would yeah. think yeah. that the people that would benefit from that. Uh, David, to the just, chair. Just a segue, um, I think that's great that you guys can make that work with the public sidewalk. Um, I just had a question about the, the sidewalk around the entire, uh, along the street. Mm -hmm. it, will there be um, the green belt in between? For the, um, at the at the at the at the crossings, we had asked the board that we could if we could um, eliminate the grass strips. Sure, and I'm again, that was to squeeze. I'm not concerned with little sections. I just overall. Third. Overall, there will be a three okay. foot uh, grass strip between the berm and the sidewalk. Great, thanks. Perfect. The majority of it will have the grass strip. Right. Thank you. Right. And um, and back to Wood Street, um, you were saying that. Between there's going to be the <coughs> the guardrail that I've seen, yep. four foot sidewalk, yep. a, a little berm. A berm tall. Yeah. It'll be a, yeah. It'll be similar to one like when you're coming off 195 coming here, um, the right on is that West Main Street that comes up here. Um, it's a seven inch reveal on um, the asphalt itself, so it's probably about that tall. Mm -hmm. um, Standard berm. Right, yeah, it's, it's not the low Cape Cod that we're proposing inside the subdivision. 
it's an actual, it's almost a vertical face, so that if somebody did come along and they rub up against it with a tire, it's enough to be able to, they won't ride right up on it, is what I'm getting at. It's, uh, so, and then the space left for bikes, you were, you were alluding to this, that obviously part of it is tighter than other parts, but I yep, was... Right up at, um, right, 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 feet, right, right up at the existing Whisper, um, there's a little, there's about a, about a hundred foot stretch where, um, where there's enough room to do a full foot sidewalk or berm and have about a foot behind the fog line. And then it widens out, it tapers out and gets wider. Okay. As you go along, and one foot, <laughs> and and I see, I mean, and maybe it's eighteen inches, but it's 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 in the foot range, okay. but which is not inconsistent with the rest of town, mm -hmm. in hundreds, maybe thousands of locations, mm -hmm. but I know it'd be great to have three feet, but yeah, and you do have the sidewalk right there, sorry, through the chair, so it does allow the biker, <coughs> bikes yeah. really the sidewalk. No, no, I mean the area you're riding in that middle area, you have the side to. You're kind of up against trees or anything. Well, it's, it's worse to get a curve. Yeah. You pedal when you hit a. You can't bow. Take it from you, you're a biker. I can't speak for it. Well, that sidewalk. I realize that, yeah. that for people yeah. that want to exercise or use that loop, but I just. Uh, as a cyclist, it's, it is going downhill, so. Not ideal, and we certainly have lots of other narrow ways. It just it, 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 it hurts me a little bit as a cyclist when we have, you know, when we're making changes that negatively affect. affect um, cyclist safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And we like to stay off of sidewalks because they're usually covered with sand and gravel and yeah. And, and, so, and, and so is the first uh, foot or so of inside of that curb on the inside. road. So yeah. neither yeah. today I'll, I'll be in the street when I ride down there. But it's just me personally. It's a trade off. Yep. It, it kind of really. Um, just any other questions there on the traffic piece? I want to check the box on that one. I'm actually going to bypass stormwater management right now. I want to actually go to utilities because I see the chief here. And I don't know if, if um, you know, chief, if you wanted to weigh anything under utilities, it looks, it lists water, fire, um, et cetera. So I don't know if, if, since I have you here, since we have you here, chief, uh, if there was any comments or. Yeah, my review of the plan showed it's going to have fire protection with the water hydrants uh, throughout the development. and. Um, the driveway is going to meet the new bylaw, so I think those are the two areas that I speak to. You're in a good place. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Um, sticking on the utilities theme, uh, Ryan, you just want to go through anything in terms of sewer, gas, electric, cable, and we we'll talk also and touch a little bit on septic. Um, let's, let's touch on that as well. Um, so s sewer, we're going to have we're gonna, we've got our private system. Um, the Board of Health is, is, uh, has agreed to allow us to do that. Um, we haven't given up on town sewer, but it's probably not going to happen. Um, we do have the water. Gas, I believe gas goes by out on Wood Street, but um, we, can't, we can't get any service from gas companies. Uh, we're dealing with, with them kind of scattered all over the place, and it's terrible. They won't, what do you mean, they won't respond or? People, no, they just, they don't, yeah, they don't respond or, or they say it'll be next year or something. It's, it just doesn't work. So uh, we've been using, and a lot of builders have been using propane. They bury a propane tank on the site. And Is that the plan for this subdivision to go propane? At, at this stage, yes. Mm -hmm. But we haven't reached out to the gas company yet. But we know what's going to happen. So we'll have cable, we'll have underground electric, and um, you know, and, and then propane. There, all the conduit will be in there for whatever whatever has to be done. Interesting, Carol. I just could you take us back to the septic system and how that's going to work as far as maintenance and funding for repairs or replacement? Yep. Or yep. Um, it'll be part of the condo association, and. Um, it actually is, um, it'll be modeled after something in town. Um, I think it's, a, hmm, I forget where it is. But there's one in town that is, you, is that it's in operation. The Board of Health likes it. Oh, they don't have any problems with it. Um, and um, 
it so it's Charleston? you know what's that is it a Charleston yeah. no Colorado? that's the one they don't that's the one okay. that everything's crossed yes yeah. Yeah. That one's the best. no okay. no yeah. that's another one but I think it's actually a water system that they're happy with but I could be wrong on that too um, so so yeah so everybody's going to be have an interest in that just as they would if it were, if the open space went stayed with them rather than go to the town um, so it'll be in their deed they'll have they'll all share maintenance it'll they'll be in an agreement that is a, is part of their deed or attached to the deed or accompanies the deed that um, <coughs> It'll all it'll all be a common common venture. Um, the the maintenance is done is subcontracted. Um, I think they inspect. I think they come out and do maintenance once a month or once every two months. And uh, it's not a great deal of money. It's cheaper in the long run than a, than an individual septic system. Um, it's better for the environment than an individual septic system. Uh, and that will all be outlined in the homeowners association document. Yes. Yeah. Or yeah, or a specific document for the for the sewer treatment. And, and we're going to get a copy of that document prior to. Um, yes. <coughs> yep. Yep. When we produce that, we'll we'll definitely share that. Carol, anything else? Any other questions from board members on utilities? Yeah, uh, a couple of questions. Yeah. Just one real quickly on the. Um, the sewage. So you showed us before, <coughs> come down and go across and then be pumped up. What about the, in that diagram, the upper right hand corner there? How will that sewage flow? Um, this, there's nothing up in here. There's no houses. Okay. So it's just these few houses here. The downhill floor flow downhill this okay. way into this pump chamber. Or it's, it's basically a giant septic tank and then an aeration tank and then a pump chamber tank. And then from there, it pumps up uphill to here. And then just a separate question. Um, no nursing on the utility pole throughout the development? I'm sorry. Telephone pole, no telephone pole. Oh, no pole. Should no, no I'll call on the Just double checking. Thank you. And then this is where we talk about bedroom numbers. Yes. Too, right? And I know the school department will be curious to hear how many bedrooms. Bedrooms. Actually, it's designed for uh, four bedrooms. Um, it's designed for under just <coughs> under ten thousand gallons, and that's uh, that's going above ten is a is a trigger for a whole different level. Um, okay, so each home can have up to four bedrooms. Um, what's that? Each home can have up to four bedrooms. Up to four, yeah. Um, though, uh, my, I think we need to do two conventional systems in that mix. I don't think we can <laughs> quite make the 24, um, 24 four bedrooms. I think we get 22 out of it. And there are two existing systems that well, are oh, certainly okay. workable. That'll be the number we have to share. The system for this house in this house. So you're going to maintain those systems? Is that yeah. what you're yeah. They'll be out of the association for those two. They're on the existing wall. Okay, so those will have their own septic systems. <coughs> just like today, so they, essentially what they have today, correct? What's that? that? Just like what they have today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah, probably same location, same, same everything. So, I'll, I'm going to pause here on this. Um, I think we're check the box on utilities, unless anybody else has any questions. I do think at some point we're gonna have to communicate the, the four bedroom and 22 back through to its school. My one thing on utilities is just a question. Is there any possibility of solar? Is it too heavily wooded? You know, and and um, just entertaining the each individual home as well as is there any place where the community can have solar panels for instance? Um, the only place I can think of would be on top of the septic system, and I'm not sure if uh, if you can do that with the. <coughs> are you familiar with that? I, I don't know if you can put panels. I think it would be. I think it'd be. We'd be limited to rooftops and maybe some small 
arrays and backyards or maybe the front heads with probably backyards. And Right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it all off after after her. Unfortunately, I've just gotta gotta move on. Um, we haven't thought of doing that specifically, but we'd like to okay. explore it at least. Okay. Good. So uh, Elaine, next meeting, I'm gonna kind of start it up with stormwater management piece with with with, um, with the applicant. Um, is there space on? I don't know if you can do it December third or. December 17. Sorry, Deb. He's got to get it. Uh, no, December 3rd, if we have any time. It uh, looks like we're kind of booked up through about 8.30 or 9 o'clock. It depends on whether uh, the Maspinac Woods um, people um, go through with their cancellation. I think they will. So I'm going to 8.30, we have 18 Cedar Street. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how long we should so do we want to try to get it in on December 3rd or right uh, it'd be nine o'clock can you do can you do nine o'clock Ron on the third sure. right and I, and I think at that meeting we'll pick up where we left off there's there are some of those outstanding issues from beta we saw the response I think you got as well but it seems like a lot of those can be worked out and so if you're meeting with them tomorrow I think we can kind of have a clean version of everything from beta. Um, and then I think the one other thing is Conservation Commission. Um, just like to get a sense in terms of are they done with you guys and is, is it all thumbs up or there are still some outstanding issues? No, they're, they're not done. Um, <laughs> they got a, I think they got a, a full um, briefing on it from Scott Goddard yep. uh, at the last meeting. Um, and I, it seemed to me it went very well. The comments from the board were for positive. Um, it's a challenging site for sure, um, but I think that they're uh, I think they're getting they're getting a sense that of what it is, and and uh, I mean all the numbers work. It I I think that in the end we have a we leave a cleaner site than than what's there now. And um, so when are you going to meet with those guys again? Do you have it on that? Um, yeah, I think it's uh, um, it's it's pretty soon. Uh, I mean, it, in a perfect world, if you could get that ComCom -com piece buttoned up and all wrapped up, get the beta piece all wrapped up, then come back to <coughs> us. I think we'd be able to move yeah. relatively quickly through the the other outstanding issues. Because if because if ComCom -com still has an outstanding issue, and you come back to us. I think we're going to come back and you know have the discussion and say you know we want to see where where com comes netting out. I don't think we're going to be having any more of the. I mean, from all the meetings we've had with conservation, I think we've narrowed everything down and shrunk everything as far as we can, and I believe they're satisfied with what we've done to the point where you know, they're going to have to vote on it then. Anything right? that anything now that changes won't be substantial within as far as the layout or anything whether it's a you know minor minor changes at this point so I think, we're, I think we're on with concom on the 27th all right so you might be able to get to be a good place with we'll us. make some headway hopefully for the for the december 3rd all right december 3rd nine o'clock thank you uh make a motion to close the public hearing Jennifer, oh, continue. continue sorry 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 <laughs> continue the public hearing to december 3rd at nine o'clock could I say one thing? Also, we need more time to wait for the 17th. Yes, that's ah. fine. Okay. Two weeks after that, so that would be the 17th of December. Yeah. I mean, I'll ask you again to confirm um, by email. Oh, okay. okay. You're going to ask me again by email? Or? Well, no, I'm going to ask you to agree okay. to the extension. The extension again. of the decision date. Okay. Two weeks post. So just to be clear, we're voting on just the... To continue, to continue the public hearing to December 3rd at 9 o'clock and to move the decision date on that for two weeks post December 3rd, which would be December 17th? 17th. Clear. All those, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstain? Very good. See you gentlemen on December 3rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right.
I'm losing a little bit of time. So let's see if we can kind of make up some of that here with uh, a couple of approval not required applications. Uh, looks like there is a total of uh, one, two, three, four, five applications. The first one being Zero Montana Road. <clears throat> Zero Montana Road. It looks like this plan was previously endorsed by the board in 2011, but yet was never recorded. Um, the applicant has resubmitted the same plan to be endorsed again for recording. Um, I believe we have a representative for the applicant. Yeah, yeah good evening, Joe okay. Markadon. Um, we did not prepare that plan, but I'm well versed in all the details that took place. You're spot on. Uh, in 2011, they did some estate planning within the Stratton family. Uh, Trish Kelly was a Stratton. She received one of those parcels. Her cousin Anthony received the other. She got the larger of the two, the one that was before you folks uh, a month ago for endorsement. Someone dropped the ball and never recorded that plan. They took the most recent plan in with that my law from 2011, and the Registry uh, of Deeds rejected that plan. So they have resubmitted that plan for endorsement with an updated date uh, so that they can get everything back straightened out and record both plans simultaneously and do their estate planning and then begin this second process of developing the house lots that you endorsed a month ago. Did they reject it because it was not re, uh, recorded it back in 2011? Months, so, over six months since the endorsement. Closer to seven years. All right. um, <laughs> any any questions from members of the board? Uh, if not, I will entertain a motion to um, approve the plan for Zero Montana Road. We need. I think we need to approve it, right? Uh, I, vote to endorse it. Vote to endorse it. Vote to endorse right. it. Discussion. Question. Discussion. David. Do we know if that. Montana Road continues through that lot. Is that a uh, paper road or? Uh, what is that? Existing right of way. I can't zoom that much on the iPad. Let's see what it says there. It says existing right of way. But I don't know what that okay. means. It so no doesn't way. change that at all, just keeps yeah. things. Yeah. Um, Montana Road continues through <coughs> the Stratton parcel. <coughs> But they have designated that plan as, as not a building lot at this time. So any development, future development on the part of Stratton, they'll have to uh, go back and see this board to work out the details. Fine with it, thanks. All right. All right, any other discussion? I believe we have a motion and it's seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Thanks, Joe. Are you still here for the next one? If you want to entertain the discussion about Coderville Road, then I'll hang around. Um, which, was, is that Cedar, Cedar Street? Cedar Street. Oh, okay. Okay. You're kind of coming out. All right. So the next um, approval not required plan is for 275 Cedar Street. Uh, Peter Carbone. Joe? Again, Peter Carboni owned, owns uh, the five plus acres on the corner of Lincoln Street and Coderville Road. His home is number 275. What he would like to do is at the end of the frontage on Lincoln Street is to create a building lot. So this plan lays out a lot that has the minimum frontage and slightly over the minimum area. And uh, Peter intends to uh, sell that lot off and retain the four point five one acres around his home. So the plan shows that the new lot has adequate frontage on Lincoln Street. Questions from the board? Is he the plan in front of you? Pardon me? Is that the plan in front of you? Yes. I just wanted to see where the street is. The roads. Yeah. Put a bill here. Dave. My question might help clarify some of what you're Go ahead, Dad. Um, I just want a visual. I just, yeah, um, I found it a little confusing when I went to research it that 275 Corderville Road is actually an address in Ashland. Um, and we have it written down here as 275 Cedar Street. 
So I, um, does that mean we need a correction on the plan? Uh, Corderville, Corder, Cedar Street turns and goes up Cedar Street Extension. Corderville Road takes up, at that point, heads northly to the town line. That front is actually Corderville Road. Peter's address is Cedar Street. We thought to reduce the confusion, we would maintain Peter's address in the title block, but that section of the road is actually Corderville Road. So, Elaine, is there one good way to do this to minimize confusion? Right, so this has been confusing since as long as I've been aware of it, but it's a historical reference to the road name. So, so it's yes. historical as, as in it's called 275 Corderville versus... Well, their address, Cedar their address is Cedar, Cedar Street, Street, but it may actually be Corderville Road. Where's Corderville Road? Right where Cedar it's Street extension goes extension. left. Okay. But before the condominiums and the state park entrance. Yeah. So then from there northly to the town line is Corderville Road. So is there a way that we could maybe simplify it by putting Corderville slash Cedar Street so that so that it's an obvious misnomer? Or, or put Cedar, Cedar Street um, for parentheses Corderville Road. Is that ever done um, as a clarification? I'm just concerned that when you do a Google search, it's never going to, is, is it ever going to come up as 275 Corderville Road Huffington, or is there always going to be that confusion? And if you Google it, you'll have to pull up 275 Cedar Street in order to get it. I think it's probably more important as to what it's indexed at the Registry of Deeds. Okay. And Google can figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Google will probably always be wrong. So, but. Okay, so as far as the Registry of Deeds, it is now 275 Corderville Road. And that's, there's no confusion that it's Hopkinton, not Ashland. I'm just... I don't think there's a confusion there. There's a confusion, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, that, is there a motion on the table to approve? So moved to endorse. Right, right. right. To <laughs> endorse 275 Cedar Street. All right, so there's been uh, a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, further discussion? All, all right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, abstain. So passes. I'm abstain? Gonna, I'm going to abstain. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six yeses, zero noes, one abstention. Okay. All right. Thank you, Joe. endorse at the end of the meeting tonight? Um, let's do that. Let's do that because we're running a little okay. bit behind. I'll pick those up right. tomorrow maybe. Great. Thanks, Thanks Joe. For your time. Thanks. The next one, uh, hopefully we can move quickly. Uh, 18 and 20 Fruit Street, 20 Fruit Street LLC. Is the proponent or anyone representing the proponent? I see none. Um, so. It's a quick one. It should be a quick one. Uh, previously endorsed by the board on two, February 26th of this year, but never recorded at the registry. Um, the only plan change on the original endorsement is that the house number for 18 Fruit Street has been noted now on the plan. Um, I can go through the details there, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, did this one just get missed, Elaine? I think it's another one where it wasn't recorded. It just wasn't recorded. They lost it, they lost it yeah. All right, so. it missed the six months. Um, discussion, questions by members of the board? So, if not, I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, 18 and 20 Fruit Street, A and R. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, abstain. So passes. All right. The next one, A and R plan, Legacy Farms North, comma zero Wilson Street, Legacy Farms LLC. Uh, we have the applicant here, Roy. Um, the plan delineates six parcels on the north side of Legacy Farms with parcels having frontage on Legacy Farms Road North and Wilson Street. Yes, so we actually, have, <coughs> we actually have two plans for you this evening. <clears throat> the first one is on Wilson and Legacy Farms North. It's uh, subdividing six lots. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Is that simple? Very straightforward. <coughs> uh, questions from board members? I just want to make sure this doesn't change the number of buildable units on the property. Not at all. Okay. Uh, this is actually quite in compliance with everything we've been doing. 
the next step after we hopefully get the two a and r's approved is we need to sit down with elaine and georgia to go over the uh, re remaining restricted land that'll be the next step yeah all right any other questions i'll entertain a motion to approve uh, legacy farms north zero wilson street so moved second and a second any further discussion all right um all those in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. all those opposed all those abstain motion carries thank you very much the next a r plan for legacy farms north comma franklin road legacy farms llc mr mcdowell yes this is another plan which is actually the north side of legacy farms road north and this is again for the remaining six lot subdivision uh, and it looks like all in, con in conformance with the agreements with the town yep all parcels have frontage on legacy road north as well as franklin road uh, the plan appears a title to endorsement any uh further questions by board members i'm just wondering excuse me <laughs> yes. i'm just wondering oh why there are such strange shapes is it due that's, to that's actually a very good question or? it's a very good question <clears throat> they look strange but if you saw the overlay of the way the homes sit on them mm -hmm. in the way the um, stage takedown of the various lots are because it might be a curve in the road it might be a few houses in a particular spot and when you cut the line between this various takedowns that's why it looks so strange okay. thank you all right, if there are uh, no further questions, I'll entertain a motion to approve um, the plan for Legacy Farms North, Franklin Road. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Further discussion? Yeah, just a quick question. Is that Curve Street coming from a different location? Right. Uh, Curve Street actually comes up from Phipps oh, Street. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Was it just your clarification? All right, any other questions, discussion by the board members? All right, seeing none, um, all those in favor signified by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, abstain. Motion carries. All right, so that covers all the A and R's, I believe. Uh, the next topic on the agenda is East Main Street Sidewalk Discussion, Legacy <coughs> Farms. Mr. McDowell. Yes, so as you recall, the last time we met, we had an issue with how were we going to finish the last section in front of the athletic field parcel because even though the town has approval by the CONCON to do a bridge, there's really no funding in place, nor is there a plan at the moment to do that. So the board suggested I go back and figure it out. So I actually met with uh, Don McAdam down there and looked at the situation. Yeah. And we've come to the conclusion that if we move the guardrail back, this is in front of the parcel that we donated to the town. If we move that guardrail back three feet further from the street, probably 200 feet in distance, we can then run the sidewalk by. However, it obviously would require the approval of CONCOM. So even though Don thought it, it was a plausible idea, I actually went to the CONCOM last week in an open session hearing on an informal basis, explained this. I brought pictures, I brought a plan. I said, by the way, the planning board wants us resolved so we can get this done. This is an idea we have we think will work. By the way, I've, I've also gone through this with John Westling, and I believe John sent an email today to Georgia. I think you may have gotten it. So jo John is in favor of it. The CONCOM said, in principle, it looks good to them. He said, if the planning board is on board, then we will begin plans to submit to the CONCOM for approval, and then we can build the sidewalk. Hmm. So it seems like, generally speaking, uh, <laughs> please. Um, so we're moving the guardrail back three feet so that we can build a five foot sidewalk? Yes. My concern is if we're going to the trouble of moving the guardrail, why don't we move it closer to the street and have the pedestrians on the other side of the guardrail? I actually. Uh, they won't let us do that. But you're going to have a timber abutment. Well, it, it, this is how particular they are. They said, how are you going to move the guardrail? We won't allow you to dig holes because you'll be displacing dirt. And I said, we're not going to dig holes. We're literally going to take a machine that picks up the, the I-beam and pounds it into the ground three feet back. So they said, you can do that, but we won't let you fill there. So if you don't put the sidewalk on the other side of the guardrail, 
you'd literally have to fill it up significantly to get it level somewhat higher than the street. The way it is now, by moving it back three feet, it'll still be on the public right of way, but it'll give us enough room to have a raised cur a berm, keeping the fog line in the street, a raised six inch berm, and then a five foot sidewalk without disturbing anything in the wetlands. We're talking almost inches here as far as being in the wetlands, so it's, it's a very tricky situation. So I was expecting it, that response. I'm fine with it. Thanks. I, I agree with what you're saying if it was feasible, but I know they wouldn't approve it. Yeah. I figured there was a big drop off in the back. It's a huge drop off. Follow up question? I, I, I followed. Um, I'm, I'm still a little concerned um, about that area because it's, there, it's not safe, but it's worse now than it would be after you fixed it. So, but I'm still a little unhappy because you've got that, you know, you're moving the guardrail, which is supposed to protect pedestrians well actually it's not the guardrail is for the purpose of the cars not driving into the ditch yes. it's not for pedestrians at all well in up in upper parts of the sidewalk further into town the guardrail protects pedestrians yeah. and and they use fencing on the inside to protect the the cars and the pedestrians both so there's a question is it is there any potential to use <coughs> fencing which is only three inches wide and have the guardrail stay where it is the guardrail actually is a little over a foot wide because you've got a post that's about seven inches, you've got a guardrail that's about five inches, the two combined is about a foot, mm -hmm. so there really isn't room. I will say that there's multiple different types of berms. There's a very low profile berm, there's a Cape Cod berm, and there's a six inch vertical berm, you know, it's a little higher. Mm -hmm. I would suggest we use the higher berm because it just gets you that much more delineation between the height of the street and the height of the sidewalk. So I think if we use a higher berm, I think it'll be a much safer situation. And the fact that you have a fog line, is it perfect? No, but the reality is when you look at most of the sidewalks around Hopkinton, it's the exact same detail. Yeah. Is there, is there, sorry, Go ahead. Chair. Yes. Is there a potential of looking at um, what was done further up the street, which is fencing and then keeping the guardrail and putting the, putting the guardrail, the, the sidewalk, and then the fencing? Is it possible to repeat that or is that just not? It, 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 it in some places, could you maybe, but the reality is, given the fact that we're talking inches in this 200 plus feet of wetlands area, there's no way you could do that, because that gets back to the issue of then shifting the sidewalk further back from the street, because now you're moving a guide rail and you're putting a fence in. It, it the fences are like maybe six. But yeah, but it's the guide rail, the guide rail's a foot wide. It, would be, it, it wouldn't work from a concom point of view. Mm -hmm. But I think your, your previous point is a good one in that Having a raised sidewalk is a much, much safer situation than what you have today. What you have today is people just walking on the shoulder of the road. Right. Yeah. Sorry, yeah go ahead, call. last. Yeah. We had just um, been talking with the Whistle Way folks, and they were talking about a raised berm of eight inches, um, a raised curb or berm of eight inches. Is that a possibility? I mean, I think, I, I, I don't know. I've never seen a berm eight inches. I mean, you probably could push it to six and a half or seven inches. The other thing you could do, if you're that concerned about the safety of it, you might want to just take that berm and paint it yellow. I mean, really draw attention to it, or white or something, because if you really want people to see it as they're driving, you could do something like that. Or like yeah. granite colored, like real granite. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I like... Yeah. I, I like the fact that they've come up with a solution. I like the fact that there's a solution in general. Yes. Um, being somebody who does run and a lot of, especially in the marathon season, a lot of those people you're running into traffic and you're just, to have anything yeah. like a sidewalk is, is better. Do you have one question please? please. Do you know how much space there is between the fog line and the curb in the new plans? Uh, I'm gonna take a guess, it's probably about a foot. So Plus or minus. I'm just going to throw something out there, and I'm, I'm wondering if it would be worth narrowing that sidewalk to four feet and giving an extra foot for the shoulder for the cyclists so that they have. A That's purely distance. up to the board. So I don't know. See just the rest of you know, it's okay for you. Just but, but, I, I, but I will say this two things ideally, if I could walk away. If I could walk away from the, the board, like us to pursue it, because now I can start the engineers on it. But if you seriously think you make it four feet, I would need to know that too, because now the engineers need to shift it back, design it at four feet. So it's not a bad idea about keeping two feet there, four feet. I mean, four feet isn't bad, but that's not my call. Yeah. So <clears throat> um, 
I won't, I won't speak on behalf of the entire board, but I do like the idea enough to say move forward with that. I think to Gary's point, uh, if we could look at a four foot sidewalk um, to accommodate both the walkers, the runners and bicyclists, you know, and stay within the, the, the construct. Chair, could I just make a suggestion there? Yeah. If anybody's opposed to please, that please. I don't want to. I don't want to speak to anybody. I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed. Carol. No, I'm fine with that. Just out of curiosity, what is the normal distance? On. Or you're talking about the fog, the, the fog the line? line I will tell you it varies. You literally go through an air hopping tent. It varies anywhere from eight inches to two feet. Average is about a foot. I think I see holistically in the perfect world, it's like about three feet, but hop container. You don't have room for three feet. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. So just as an example, when they did the, the, the traffic comment on Hayden Row, mm -hmm. um, you know, I worked with Mr. Westerling. Um, and they tried to make it three feet throughout, minimum of two feet with one little stretch that's a little bit narrower. But, but from a cyclist standpoint, two feet is two feet is adequate. Adequate. Okay. Okay, final comment. Okay. Yeah. Last two, and then we'll Sorry, I just wanted to say, close I, it. I think I agree with everything we're saying. Of a raised curve is better. It's not perfect, but it's better than one of the others, and it'll be and it'll be safer. And uh, just to comment on that, small, I think it's just a small section where there's the fence and the guardrail, what they did was they filled a, a ton of rip rock there so they could build that yeah. bridge there. So that's just a unique situation within town and that's not a common thing. Yeah, but I was but I was wondering if it's this isn't a common situation either. And so that maybe it would take some uncommon engineering to, to, to take a look at that. Um, because I, I really, um, people have died on that street and I'm, and well, especially now, but I mean, anything is an improvement. So I, to the chair, um, I totally agree with you that, that it's a far, it's a far cry from what it is now. Um, but I still do have some safety, long-term safety concerns about it. You know, maybe it's, if, Roy, if you have enough direction here to move forward and then come back, look at, uh, if have engineers, you know, put the plan together and be able to kind of then show us what that's going to look like. I don't, is that? I, I, ideally, if you tell me you want a four foot, I'd like to design it four feet. If you want a five, like, I'll end up designing it twice. Can okay. you live with, do, do you like that? I will admit that if you make it four feet and you have a much larger fog area, not only for bicycles, but for the safety of cars, it makes the sidewalk much safer if there's more distance between the fog line and the sidewalk for sure. Yeah. Is it possible to ship the guardrail to that side and then and have, but then it's difficult for bikes. bikes. So. Well, not only that, but it's 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 difficult. It's also difficult for, for snow plowing because what happens is the posts are on the side that you're plowing, yeah. as opposed to the rail. So it's it, it's way. complicated. Yeah. Right. So I, am I hearing general direction here? Four feet, right? Uh, four foot sidewalk. Okay. And, and are we talking four feet for the entire length that you need to do? Two hundred yeah. feet. Yeah. I don't think you want to vary it. Rather than rather than yeah, just four feet in that section that do the whole. I would do the whole four thing. Feet four feet. Vertical curb. Yeah. With well, it's condition. vertical berm. Berm. With the condition. What? Berm. 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 Yeah. You say berm, I say curb. Well, right. with, with the condition that the space between the fog line and the curb is maximized. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Does that help? So what I'll do then is we'll do a plan. Uh, if you like, <laughs> I can bring it back and show it to you before I go to Concom. And once we go to CONCOM, it'll have to go through the normal process of advertising, public hearing, uh, appeal period, et cetera, et cetera. But once that's approved, we can, we can build it. Beautiful. Okay. All right. Helpful. Thank you, Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right. Making up a little bit of time back. Um, actually, I made up a fair amount of time. Um, I think we have, we have a few minutes before the Continue public hearing for 52 and 55 Wilson Street. Can we take a break? Uh, we could take a break or do uh, miscellaneous business. Want to take a five minute break and then five minute break. Five minute break, everybody. And then we'll do the minutes, yeah. 9 10. Uh, 9 10. Don't be tardy. And then we'll do minutes and any uh, miscellaneous business. So then hopefully we can.
a lot. Is that it? Just in the past. Yeah. No. No? Yeah. I don't remember one. I mean, we're talking about it all the time. Mm, but never Every couple of years, but nothing was ever submitted. I mean, not as shy as maybe the John Easterly, but nothing ever. Nothing, nothing that came to the planning board, no. Okay. four or five years, they come in and talk about it, but I never submitted anything. Okay. And now I'll look back and see, but I don't remember, because he would have disappeared. Do. It is now 9:10. Uh, we will reconvene for the next item of business on the agenda, and that is the continued public hearing of 52 and 55 Wilson Street. This is for the stormwater management permit application, as well as the earth removal permit application, EverSource Energy. Are we allowed to start early? Uh, oh no! You know what? I'm sorry. I got five minutes. I'm sorry. Sorry, guys. I got a little ahead of myself. Um, we got five minutes before you guys. Let us take care of some miscellaneous business from the board. Uh, and the first will be approval of the minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, uh, not the previous meeting. Is it the two meetings ago? Two meetings ago. Thank you, Gary. Um, so any questions, comments on the minutes? No. Anybody? No, I looked through them quickly. They look pretty good. So I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes as stated. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, abstain. So carries. <coughs> All right. Other miscellaneous business, since we have a few more minutes. Um, any report outs from any of the boards or commissions that planning board members sit on? Mary. So from the ZAC, we had our first meeting. Um, and 
We, of course, are still looking for additional uh, associate members, if anyone is interested. Um, but uh, we are having a public hearing on Monday, November 26th at 7 p.m. here in this room. So really welcome members of the public to come and give us their thoughts and ideas. Did you guys, uh, I'm just curious who, who's going to chair Zach? Ms. Mary is the chair. I'm the chair. Oh, yeah. wow, congratulations. That's exciting. <laughs> and have you guys discussed at all any potential themes or area of focus or? We have discussed TV? the um, the the initial ideas that were presented by various boards and so on, and um, just to walk through it, just to give people an idea, you know, on the board who, what what is being raised for us. We have not um, determined which ones we're going to focus on first, um, but, uh, but you know, we, we have, we also have some, <coughs> excuse me, depending on, on how, um, how many members of the public come to speak <coughs> to us on November 26, we also have um, uh, a few things that we'll discuss that day, you know, shorter items that we think, like you know, banners, size of the banners across Main Street, things like that that are very quick and easy that we can then pass on um, before a town meeting. But there's quite a number of things that have been raised that would be longer discussions, so. Very good. I fully endorse uh, members of the public to come to the meeting on the 26th. Um, it's a great opportunity for everyone to get involved. Uh, if they have ideas or thoughts regarding the town, Zach is a, is a great forum for that. Question for you, in terms of new members that are interested, would they send you an email or should they just show up on the 26th? What's the? Um, well, I believe they'd have to be approved by the planning board, right? So they gotta come. So I think they have, they have to go through they have to come Lane. Through you to so. submit an application. But they can come as a member of the public Absolutely. at the meeting on the 26th. Yeah. Absolutely. Very good. Um, any other? Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. Any other updates, board members? We've got the CPC continued public hearing uh, tomorrow uh, here in this room. Um, I don't think there's anything that's overly pertinent. Well, there are a few things pertinent tonight, but I'm um, probably in a better position. But if anybody has interest, the public hearing is tomorrow, 7 p.m. here. Yeah. Very good. All right. Anything else, correspondence to touch base on? Uh, we're at 9.14. I was just going to say, the design review board meets tomorrow, so I think we'll go over if we have any recommendations for Zach too. Great. Thanks. Okay. Very good. All right, now it is 9.15. <laughs> now we can bring up the Eversource team to discuss the uh, continued public hearing, <coughs> excuse me, for 5255 Wilson Street stormwater management permit application and the earth removal permit application. I will entertain a motion to open or open or continue the public hearing. So Second. All right, uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain. The public hearing is now open. Jim and team, come on up. Right. So just for um, you know, clarification purposes for the folks at home as well as um, the members of the board, um, this is specifically for the stormwater management permit as well as the earth removal permit application. Um, I'll have the, the Eversource team and their engineers kind of talk through, provide a general overview just to bring everybody up to speed um, and then walk through some of the additional um, criteria as it's laid out. All right. And I'll start, I'm Tracy Adamski, project manager with Ty and Bond. I'm Renny Janigian. I'm the plant manager at the LNG plant. Jim Blackburn, I'm the project manager for Eversources LNG Group. Awesome. Thank you. I guess just to do a, a quick overview, um, again, we're here today for the <coughs> proposed liquefaction replacement project. So this is um, occurring to the south of the existing tanks at the LNG facility to replace aging equipment that is over on the east side of Wilson Street. 
Um, in front of you is a stormwater <coughs> permit um, for the new development, and we're proposing to address stormwater through an infiltration basin that'll be located to the um, south and to the west of the proposed development. And, uh, and the stormwater management has been designed in accordance with the, your, your municipal bylaw as well as the Massachusetts um, Department of Environmental Protection stormwater regulation and standards. And Beta has reviewed the project as well and uh, has issued a, a sign-off on um, that we've addressed all their concerns. I think there were two conditions that were um, outstanding. One was to limit the amount of excavation during the construction period in the infiltration basin to be able to maintain the infiltration capacity in those locations, and um, as well as to provide the final slip before we go to construction. There's also an earth removal permit. Um, I think as we've, we've discussed before, there's a net import of material coming into the facility, but there is some, uh, a lot of rock that's located in the area of the proposed liquefaction facility, and uh, there might be the need to remove some material from the site. So the information that we had provided previously was kind of a, a worst case scenario of what may um, have to be removed off site. Um, we're looking to find locations on site to be able to put that material, but wanted to have the option for the contractor should they need to remove some material off site. And um, at, based on some of the concerns that had been raised at the previous hearings, um, we have brought um, Ray here today with us who can talk about some of the past practices specifically related to the firefighting foam and address some of the, the issues um, regarding that. We did provide you with some information in writing um, that kind of address the, have the MSDS for the, the firefighting foam, as well as some of the, the written practices that are occurring at the facility. And uh, Randy can talk about more of the, the history and uh, the practices at the plant. Okay. Um, I'll give you the floor and maybe just kind of provide a brief overview of, of what that's been. Sure. So um, foam is used in two areas of the plant. Um, one area is adjacent to uh, tank storage tanks A and B, uh, and specifically there's pump systems that are external to the tank uh, where basically they are LNG processing areas. The second area is our high pressure pump house, which is actually on the um, east side of uh, the plant um, inside a building, again, where LNG pumping is, is administered. Um, our foam his practice is to, uh, basically, we don't use much foam. We, we seldom use foam. Um, the practice is we, we test it to ensure that it is suitable for use. Um, and our testing is done using the water-based system. So the way that the foam system works, it basically takes concentrate, which resides in a foam house, and water, so when the foam system would be activated or called, water flows through that system. Uh, it uses what's called a Venturi effect system, which basically as the water flows across a valve, it draws foam in small quantities into the water and it mixes, and then it flows across an agitator. When the water foam mixture goes across the agitator, um, the agitator mixes it up, which would deploy foam. Um, foam is expensive and um, just in general practicing our protocol is that when we test the system we valve out the foam and by seeing that the water system is working and is flowing across the agitators then uh, that demonstrates to us that the foam system would work as it's originally intended. In addition to that, we do foam testing and foam sampling of the concentrate by sending that to the manufacturer to ensure that um, it is suitable for use. Um, and by deduction, if both the water system is working correctly with the agitators and the foam is to its appropriate concentration, then we have high confidence that the foam system will work as intended. Um, in practice, 
So we've, there was a test that was done in approximately 1990. Um, my understanding is that that test resulted in successful deployment of foam. Um, there was a, uh, some extent of some offsite impact associated with that. Uh, in 2007, we performed another test that was done uh, as a demonstration for the fire department. Um, again, that was at the tank farm area on a tank and spe specifically. Um, foam would have been deployed or was deployed uh, into the pumping area where uh, it stayed locally. Um, and then in 2017, uh, we did another test at the high pressure pump house area that's <coughs> area on the east side of Wilson Street. In that instance, we actually collected the foam. We hired Clean Harbors, an environmental um, agency I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with, and the foam was all collected, um, directly disposed of into a truck and vehicle so it was contained. Um, so our, our protocol is to Basically, you know, we don't have PMs where, or preventative maintenance inspections or tasks where foam is deployed. Um, again, for the reasons that I described, given the expense and the cost and the management as well as um, just general housekeeping. Um, I got a couple questions. Sure. So <coughs> there's been really only three instances where you've done that testing on the phone, right, 1990, 2007, and 2017? Those are the ones that we have direct knowledge of, and um, yes, I, I can't speak to, I, I, was, I started as the plant manager in 2006, um, so as far as the, uh, you know, talking with my fellow operators and site supervisors, um, again, our practices that we don't deploy that actively. It's only by special occasion or um, other need that we would actively do that. Got it. Okay. Questions by board members. Um, what dilution factor do you use for the, the water and foam? So it's so, so the foam is is listed as uh, two and three quarter percent foam concentrate. Um, so I described that venturi effect. And the application, it's a 50 to 1 or 100, between a 50 to 1 and 100 to 1 mm -hmm. um, dilution. And that's uh, depending on the, the system operation, the agitator. But we, we do that in accordance with manufacturer's recommendations, and that's prescribed by the actual mixing of the specific valve. But and I understand the safety data sheet, which thank you for providing, and I also looked it up online. Um, that it is a highly toxic substance um, to humans and to aquatic life and to you know, pretty much anything. Um, but that's in its concentrated form. So um, in its more dilute form, um, do, you know, is anyone here you know, a chemist who can speak to the toxicities um, in the dilution factor? You know? So I don't know. I'm not a chemist, um, you know, so certainly the MSDS suggests that, um, you know, mm -hmm. there is some environmental or toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, once deployed, um, there's the additional opportunity. So in, in the event that, that it's deployed for an emergency, um, then most likely we're going to be there with the fire department and there's additional water that's going to be applied to cool equipment. Um, again, for testing, we're minimizing deployment. Mm -hmm. We're now in the protocol of collecting it. Um, in the event that there are unique circumstances where, let's say that there was accidental deployment, um, perhaps by mechanical malfunction or some other reason, um, there's the opportunity to further dilute that with water. And that would be our protocol. Okay. When, um, well, obviously, Foam, when you see visibly, you know, that's just a visible sign of it. Um, even after the foam is dissipated, the chemicals remain. Um, but in your um, catch basins on site and so on, when, when there has been foam there or theoretically if it were used in a, in a you know, in an incident um, and there's foam there and it has dissipated, 
um, what you know what treatment is done to that uh, groundwater area is it just is it just filtering into the ground or what you know what system is there to make sure that it's not you know still affecting the environment in that area so I apologize so, I'm so not very well crafted <clears throat> question I, I don't think there is anything uh, that exists but again keep in mind that based on current practice and I guess practice since 2007 it wouldn't have that potential because it wouldn't be present unless it was a true emergency and they, mm -hmm. they released it to the impoundment basins um, so yeah if it, if it is in a true emergency will there be a lot of foam or will there be um, something you know, clean harbors later collecting it or something like that, um, such that it wouldn't be on site and, and going into the ground. Is that what, what is the practice in, it, in your plans? In so, so in a true emergency, plans. our focus, I mean, if if there's a deployment of the true emergency scenario is that there is a deployment of LNG. Mm -hmm. in which case our focus is on the hazards associated with the LNG, which would greatly outweigh the concerns about the um, foam. Um, we would look at that as part of our collective emergency response and, and address it, you know, focusing first on the preservation or, you know, on life safety, secondly on preservation of property equipment and in the environment as you know, equally as part of that. Okay. We, would, we would defer and work with uh, the fire chief or the incident commander to assess all of the hazards and ensure that everything was addressed. Okay. So, so, so let me just take her question a little bit, maybe modify it a little bit. Sure. You have that main <coughs> catch basin, right? This little goes back to the site walk that a few of us took. Um, there is, during a rain event, there's water that kind of flows out of that catch basin. Jim, I think you saw it, right? It kind of flowed out there, um, out to the, the swale there at um, on, um, Rafferty. Right. What, if any, measures are taken by the organization to ensure that that water that's flowing through is treated or not, uh, um, you know, chemically altered with anything that's that's occurred? I mean, just like it was kind of flowing straight through. And my concern is when that that water untreated eventually flows down into the Hopkinton Reservoir. As part of our, sta our standard plant procedure, so the, the large impoundment area has got two pumps that are associated with it. Um, the pumps, the, the impoundment area exists to contain LNG. Yeah. It also tends to collect rainwater, rainwater um, that, that collects there, and we need to pump that out to keep it free so that it can serve its, its designed intent. Um, prior to pumping, or prior to starting a pump, our procedures are that operators are tasked to inspect the area, verify that it's free of foam, oil sheens, debris, anything else that would not be suitable to pump off site. Um, thereafter, once that's confirmed as being uh, clear, then they may start a pump. We've got, we do that by visual inspection, we do that by cameras, there's a um, there's basically a, a level site indicator, visual control, below which um, if the water level is below that line, then we consider that normal or yeah. acceptable. Above that, then our goal is to pump basically it pump it out. Looks like it was working that Saturday that we went. I mean, if I'm, now, is there any testing of that water? I mean, my concern would be <coughs> from a visual perspective, it may look clean. Right? right, but do we know that? Right, because my concern is that that becomes drinking water for somebody downstream. And if there's anything that can be done to be able to, you know, ensure or minimize what that impact is, I think that would go a long way. Yeah, I, I guess the concern no. is uh, you know, <coughs> what would be the testing for 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 the stormwater quality. Um, you know, they. They've done the, um, the visual inspections, and there's actually very little that ends up in that basin that comes from areas that have the potential for oil and hazardous um, materials to kind of flow into that area. Mm -hmm. And through the proposed design, we're actually even we're, we're minimizing that. So we're reducing the amount of impervious surfaces that's coming from 
the plant and heading into that impounding area. That, that one that we walked on the sidewalk, that area that I'm looking yeah. at there. Um, I guess that's kind of good, but I don't know if there's any questions from you know board members or Jimmy got another uh, thought. It's just worth noting, you know, we had some conversations um, with Ansel, who's the manufacturer of foam, and, and one thing they wanted to make sure that we conveyed was <clears throat> while the MSDS sheet gives you some information about the product, it doesn't, you know, it gives you information on the, the concentrated form, yeah. it doesn't really give you a good view of the actual, I guess, implications of it having been diluted and used sure. in its. Con in its um, it's deployed state. <clears throat> um, it is a, a two out of the four on the, the health scale for the uh, the NFPA uh, triangle there. Um, uh, but the main products, and I think this is what they really wanted to make sure that they tried to convey, is you know the, the product itself is biodegradable. Um, they feel that it's an environmentally um, uh, good choice for foam products. Uh, um, the, the main components of it are basically all items that are used in household products. So if you refer to the the, uh, the ingredients page on, on the MSDS sheet, which is the, the page two, I mean, the, the main components uh, being uh, the ammonium, the alcohol, ethanol, the sulfuric acid, which is ammonium salts, <coughs> and the lauryl alcohol, but each one of those products are, are used in household products. So. Um, the ammonium, ammonium alcohol is a surfactant that's used in detergents. Um, it makes up 10 to 30 percent of this product. It also happens to be the main ingredient in palm olive, palm, palm olive dish soap. Palm olive. Palm olive. Dish soap. olive. Uh, and actually, it's a it's a larger concentrate in palm in that dish soap. Uh, the ethanol is is the same product that's within beer and alcohol. Um, at a higher concentrate than in this product. Um, the sulfuric acid, the ammonium salts, again, is another, <clears throat> is another surfactant that's used for hand soaps, uh, bath products, and is biodegradable. Um, and then the laurel alcohol is, uh, an organic, is an organic compound produced from palm oil and coconut oil. Um, it's used in shaving cream, and, and part of the reason of that is it's, um, it's stated in, in, in its specific MSDSU that it's practically non-toxic and permitted food and is a permitted food, food additive in the United States. So the main components of this, I think it's just necessary to, to make sure that we understand that the MSDS is showing you a concentrate form. So if you were to drink this out of the container, but we need to make sure that we, we kind of reference or, or keep in mind what the, the actual components of this product really are. Um, I think it would be a stretch to, to think that these concentrate, this concentrated volume, or this diluted volume, once deployed, is significantly more than any product coming out of a, uh, say, into a septic system or anything else from another household. So, I mean, I mean, the numbers seem straight up to me. I mean, uh, you know, the fact that it's going into potentially a watershed area or drinking water, there's got an impact on it. And then I'm also looking beyond just the foam products itself. Anything that goes into that basin potentially is going to kind of come out through the rainwater as well. So. I don't know, I'm just, I'm wrestling a little bit. Maybe other board members have thoughts or comments can help me out. Question. In your, in your, is there a possibility of developing a standard where it's a little bit more than just a visual test? Um, can we do some testing of the surface uh, of the tank, of the um, basin um, so that we can know how deep it is? So on a really heavy storm, we know it rains, it's been raining um, pretty intensively that it's not wearing away any of, what, of whatever was put in there in 1990 um, and bringing it down downstream because it, maybe in one situation, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not that toxic, but if you are constantly eroding the surface of this, of this basin, there is potential that there's an unknown, I think. And, and it, it would be nice if in the protocol that some kind of a, a descriptor would be made so that it's a little more than just a visual test. Um, I wonder if the Board of Health has any type I of. That too. I was just wondering if this really is really for this board, and it should be switched over to the board. I mean, we're getting we're getting a little deep. I mean, we're just it, obviously we're yeah. concerned with stormwater. Yeah. Maybe I mean, is it possible? Go ahead, so, Gary. So I mean, just from a, I mean, I don't think I would agree. We're not the ones to answer the yeah. questions about yeah. about foam and impact yeah. of that. To me, though, coming back from a stormwater perspective, at the end of the yeah. day, we're taking water that is collected on an, a, an industrial site yeah. 
and we're pumping that effectively over the over the berm uh, that's going to go down a, a stream. And so, to me, where uh, aside from the foam stuff, I mean, I just wonder if, if in today's standards, if there is some opportunity to to deal with that stormwater accumulation in the the catch basin. Um, you know, according to, to today's standards yeah. for, for formula, instead of just pumping it up and down the creek. Yeah, so I, th I think that that was where we were the last meeting. We were talking about improving possibly the, the flow of that one, um, because there's so much work being done that the improvement of that would be sort of a minimal um, give way for the town for peace of mind. Um, that that was actually reconfigured and, and new riprap put in there, new absorption requirements were put um, on, on that stormwater system too. But I think now that we've sort of brought to, to, to the conversation this other quality that I guess I would look for, um, for what we should, where, where we should go with this is I'm, um, I, I think it's, it's a little, it, it's a little, um, benign to say that it's in dish soap and it's the quantity of dish soap because I'm thinking serious eye damage and irritation, carcinogenic, carcinogenic, carcinogenicity. There's, there's carcinogens, carcinogens in it. Um, and and I, I'm just concerned that, um, that ethanol has been shown as, as, as this product it, uh, to be, to, you know, to be, do damage to people. Um, so I, I think if, if we could become more um, aware of what's in, that, what's in that basin at this present time on the surface and prepare for the future, that would be, that would be my ideal. Go ahead, if you got, I would, go, go ahead. Um, so I, I maybe two things, I'm gonna ask Elaine, is this an area where the Board of Health could, could weigh in on something like this? I think they could weigh in. Um, they're going to be concerned with the health impacts. Um, your role is the stormwater, so it's kind of working together. I mean, yeah. It's neither. It's maybe both of you together. I mean, I, I'm almost thinking. I think I mean, Gary brings up a good point. Our, we're broadly more speaking on the on the stormwater management, right? How is the flow? I think the Board of Health kind of weighs in in terms of you know what, what are the elements within that that outflow itself, um, and then I'm. You know, I'm happy to we can reach out to the Board of Health to be able to do that. I mean, there's another there's a lot of things I need to get to here, so I don't want to get caught so caught up in just all this. But I think to me, it's still an outstanding issue that I don't feel that the board is in a place where they feel comfortable with what is kind of in front of us in terms of storm water management. And, and, and so I, I just want to add that too. I recognizing that 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 the 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 retention basin pumping issue is 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 not connected to the construction area that, that we're here to discuss, but at the same point, I think it's just, it, it, it's, a, it's a concern for all of us that, that all of that, that, that stormwater is just being pumped down the creek. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't really know, I just, uh, that, that's where we all wrestle with it. And, and, and so I, 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 and I know you've mentioned that point before, Jim, that, that um, you know, that the construction area is, is, is separate from this, but for us, it's, it's still, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a broader stormwater management issue that I think concerns um, myself and I think a number of us on the board. Right. Okay. Right. Right. I think it seems like it's maybe a holdover from back in the day when people didn't care as much yeah. about, yeah. you know, environmental mm -hmm. quality. And so, but it seems to be the kind of things that engineers could design a way to clean the stormwater at, as it progresses on its way. So it seems like something that could be addressed. Boy, that would, that would be, I think, encouraging for, for the members of the board to, to, to look at something like that. Carol, you had a thought? Well, I just had a, first I wanted to thank you very much for the information you gave us, but um, <coughs> I did have a question about, you said you did a visual inspection of the water before you pumped it out? Yes. Yes, that's our procedure. Or, or some other obvious issue. What happens to the water then? It wouldn't be pumped, and it would be um, <coughs> further reviewed. So we'd have somebody like Clean Harbors come in and remove the product and, right. and determine the source of where it came from. Now I think <coughs> where it's located, and, and I think you got to recognize that the equipment that's located in that area doesn't really lend itself. <coughs> to, we don't store yeah. diesel there's, fuel there's, down there. And 
Yeah, I, I want to make sure everybody mm -hmm. is aware. There's very little at the LNG plant that would contribute to what we're talking about as far as pollution. Um, there's most of the, the equipment is electrical equipment. Um, we've got piping systems that are um, for LNG, uh, nitrogen, which is 78% of what we breathe, um, compressed air. As far as fluids that might cause a sheen, there's a couple gallons of oil that serve in a reservoir to lubricate a motor. Um, there's multiple motors, but there's only two motors on each tank. That's about it. There's, we don't store fuel, we don't store diesel, we don't have other chemicals that would typically be associated with industrial processes. Um, you know, so that the area at the tank farm is largely benign and, uh, and inert. So as the discussion goes toward the water that's pumped out, we, you know, our, our view is that it's rainwater that you know, in this very large, vast area that is designed, um, we tend to collect that. If I can just say for the chair, that, that's exactly my, my point though, is that to me, this is a stormwater issue. And it's a function of dealing with that stormwater on site as opposed to just pumping it away. I agree with you. I, I just, okay. to me, that's, that's why this is a stormwater issue. All right. So I want to, any other board member have a question, and then I'll open it up to the public here for a comment or question. Anybody else? No. Katie, would you like to come forward, please? Katie Towner, 9 Kruger Road. All right, so where to begin? <laughs> Visual oh. inspection is not a way to determine the presence of chemicals. So that is invalid. Uh, the water that collects in there needs to be tested. Uh, water quality testing, if you you just recently ordered the uh, trails to water quality the test the water that's flowing off of their land because there was a pesticide there. Well, there's chemicals here. That they're acknowledging a spill that it, they don't say anything that they cleaned it up or that they even notified the officials about it. So. Uh, and like you say, that was a rather large, there could be residue from that. So um, I would say that at a minimum, you know, water quality testing needs to be considered. And <clears throat> um, like you say, it should be carted away. It's wh what we're talking about here is not storm water. The, the new definition that, have, that they have to comply with is that stormwater that flows over industrial complexes is no longer stormwater. It, and that's why they have this report here that they did not share when, when this matrix was done by beta. They did not have this information that these, these chemicals, which they call in this, they call them high risk, um, oil and hazardous materials chemicals that are present in the industrial chemical complex, um, those chemicals are there. And when the storm water flows over them, it contaminates the storm water and um, measures need to be taken to correct that. And um, the, the the fact that they have not been forthcoming about this, um, you know, has to make you very cautious and think, well, you know, well, they did come clean here with some information, but it took a lot of doing. Um, you know, they didn't do it right away. And still, you know, I think this could be the tip of the iceberg. You know, it's not, um, and, and this, this, this concept where they talk about valving the foam out of the system, 
so that they can do their test with water. Well, foam that's valved out of a system is an example of what we call process waste. <laughs> that is waste, and that is to be captured and to be um, disposed of properly. It's not to be uh, it's not to be pumped into a reservoir, and their calculations about the reservoir is a, a 0.4 miles away from the facility. Well, there are, all of us on Kruger Road have private wells, which are considerably closer. And um, their study that they commissioned from their consultant, uh, I think that they ought to mention the neighbors and the people with private wells, and not just the Hopkinton State Park that's uh, uh, 0.4 miles away. So in, in all cases, you know, the, 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 there's a lack of, uh, you know, th there's a lack of forthcomingness here. Um, so, so Katie, good points. Um, any other things to wrap it? So the, the, what, what the bottom line here is, is that the, the evaluations that Beta made were made without the benefit of all the information. So I think they need to be reevaluated. I think the Board of Health needs to chime in. And um, water quality testing should be mandated. And um, the... Uh, also, in their stormwater report, the latest revision that they published, there's TBDs in there. So, so where they're supposed to dis disclose the chemicals that they use and everything, it's all TBD. All right. So I don't see how that can be acceptable. And um, they also say that the Hopkinton Reservoir is not a um, critical area, which it is. And by the definition that, that I've discussed, with experts, it is. Got it. Katie. So those are, those are comments okay. on the stormwater report. I've got to, got to wrap it up. It's been five minutes. And, yeah, I know I have nothing pertinent to say. No, I, you know, within <laughs> the construct of what the, this evening is what we have, I think five uh, minutes the, been Those were comments fair. about the stormwater report. Okay. And. 30 seconds to wrap it up because I'd like to have beta, uh, I'm sorry, I'd like to have the Ellen, um, Eversource people come in and respond to those comments. Right, so, so the, the, the evaluation that Beta did is not valid because they didn't do it with all the information. It should be redone. And, um, uh, you know, uh, it, what they're talking about pumping out of that basin is process waste. It's contaminated stormwater, it's process waste, and it, it, it's not okay. acceptable to pump it out. Thank you very much. Carol? Katie? Sure, Katie, question for you, Carol. I have a question for you. According to, according to uh, the report that we got from Tegan Bond, there hasn't been a foam uh, release to the environment since 2007. Is it possible the pictures are older than that? Um, the, I have, I have not made an effort to, to determine the date of those pictures. The, I think the more pertinent question is, did they report that? Did they clean it up? Okay. I, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm not the bad guy here. I, no, 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 it's just. No, and, and I appreciate all your comments. I just am trying to. The, and, and, and the fact that, that they, 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 this so-called valving of the foam and, you know, that's process waste. And, you know, a visual inspection is right. not, does not detect chemicals. Got it. Perfect. Thanks, Katie. All right, Tracy, Jim. So I guess to, I, I can answer at least one of the questions. So what we had submitted with respect to the application that was before you, including the stormwater report and, and the plans and what Beta had reviewed, were all in accordance with what was required under the stormwater management 
um, your stormwater management bylaw, as well as the Mass DEP stormwater management uh, regulations mm -hmm. and standards. And typically, those are for the new portions of the project. So there's um, you know a redevelopment portion, um, and there's there's new development. And we've designed our our site and our our portion of the project to comply with the stormwater management standards in both the bylaw and as set forth by Mass DEP. So you know, the, I think the pertinent information was provided, and that's what Beta was uh, uh, had for their review. Okay. Um, trying to think of what some of the other questions were. I guess as as far as the. Just want to make sure that everyone's understanding. So when we valve out the phone, basically that translates to, or that means that we are closing the valve that keeps the foam concentrate in its respective and proper container. So there's no release of foam, there's no release of materials as part of our test. Um, and again, as we disclosed, when we do need to perform a test, our protocol is now in place where we proactively um, coordinate with an environmental waste provider to collect that foam so that it is disposed of. So um, there isn't a release of process waste as part of our standard procedures. Got it. Um, any thought around, um, and it gets a little bit out of our purview in terms of that water quality testing? And you mentioned earlier it's very difficult to test for, but I meant they got to be testing for something, right? Well, I guess it's a matter of, you know, what parameters are you looking for? So there is, um, under the um, EPA's uh, municipal uh, separate storm sewer system, the MS4 permit that municipalities are subject to. So this is, you know, looking at all the outfalls mm -hmm. from roadways. There's a list of seven or eight parameters that um, municipalities looked at include surfactants, ammonia, E. coli, which I don't anticipate E. coli would be something that we would be concerned with here. Um, nitrogen, I mean, you know, that, um, I think there's the majority of those except for E. coli, things that we could do with a, a field test kit. Um, so that could be a possibility. And it may be something as simple as that, right? And maybe that's where, Elaine, we get the Board of Health to weigh in on something like that, just to kind of do the testing. And then I would like to look at, right, if they're doing that component, you can do a literally a kit type of test. And then I think to Gary's point is like, you know, are we then managing the storm model effectively? And we haven't even got really to the storm model, um, you know, procedures that you have on this new section, although I read them and they seem like they're, pretty comprehensive and we'll go through that in a little bit but I'm, I just look at the stormwater in totality because I think one of the criteria of the standards is no untreated stormwater and I just want to make sure that on the facility itself we're not having the untreated uh, stormwater that's going over you know the berm over toward the people that are out on Kruger in that area yes with the with the with the stormwater management with the new project again I think that's going to be pretty complete but I just want to make sure in aggregate we feel really good that there be no untreated stormwater that's being released into the into the public. Yeah, and Fair. I, I guess from from our perspective, you know, usually we're not looking at the stormwater from a portion of the site that we're not touching, I, um, and you know, so we have for the portion of the site that we are that does drain into that area, we've actually made conditions quite a bit better by reducing the amount of impervious surface that's heading in that direction. So, you know, whatever's running off from that site is going to be, you know, less less so than, you know, what you get from a typical roadway. I, I, I don't disagree, yeah, yeah. So can I suggest along those lines yeah. that we ask the applicant to get us the details of the field test, what it's testing for, that we can pass on to the Board of Health and see if they're okay with that? That might be a great solution. So provide you with the details of the field test, what it covers, and if you guys are willing to do that, before you pump out the water, then we can just pass, the, pass that on to the Board of Health. And so we, we get the Board of Health's approval before we do the testing? Is that where you're... No, 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 no. Okay. Just a one-time gotcha. one -time approval before we <coughs> the MS4. approve the stormwater plan. Right. 
And that, that might go a long way for, because I know it's not happening now, right? So I think maybe we were looking at some things in the past, but that would go a long way, I think, to address maybe some of the concerns about what's being pumped over, that it's generally just stormwater runoff, rain, for lack of a better term. Right, so just to elaborate a little bit more, in the future, if, we, if this goes forward, any time before you pump out water, you just do a quick field test on it. If it looks good, you give it a go. If not, you remediate it. I think... Would that be something we could discuss maybe more with the Board of Health? Because I, I think yeah. that might not be a practical means, but maybe we can do some sample frequency. Or I just think it's going to be difficult in the middle of a storm to. I, okay. Uh, I agree yeah. with that, right? But Figure out a frequency methodology with those guys, and if they're all, everybody's cool with that, then hopefully that addresses that, that concern. Okay. Right. Any other questions on the, this component <laughs> before we get into the actual outline? <laughs> um, process question What time did you want to go to with this? Um, I think we can kind of, I think we can get through probably two or three of these, maybe, maybe 15 minutes uh, to, to the extent that, 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 that the board, that we can kind of do that. Um, is there anything else that Tracy, Jim, and you guys would like to comment on before we actually go to the uh, stormwater outline, right? So there's an outline that we've kind of walked through the methodology. Uh, we've gotten through some of these elements, but there's uh, additional things like construction, um, earth removal, um, and I want to make sure we do it in the context of the stormwater piece as well as the earth removal piece. Um, <clears throat> perhaps another thing that we could offer too, especially if you have the Board of Health, I didn't think it made a lot of sense because having them contact directly this group, but um, maybe with the Board of Health, Health involved, um, the manufacturer of the foam had suggested perhaps um, uh, providing a Q&A session with, the, uh, with an individual uh, uh, associated with the town. So perhaps maybe the Board of Health might be the right group that could have that conversation. We might be able to facilitate that. Elaine? That way they could ask maybe some more detailed questions that we're not trying to translate. Um, yeah. Is that, is that possible? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a good, great suggestion. Helen. All right. Any other comments from board members before we jump into the uh, the outline? All right. So I'm going to pick up where we left off at the last meeting. We're in the middle of the detailed discussion, and we had just checked off Department of Public Utilities DPU status. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda was construction sequence, looking at hours of operation construction <laughs> mitigation methodology and I think let's look at it in terms of the project itself but also incorporate those um, variables like the trucks coming in if they're bringing in the you know fill um, anything that's going to be removed um, all those um, elements I'd like to kind of talk about that you like it's just a discussion kind of in general that how that's going to take place you know i think so i think the hours of operation um yeah, and that one's pretty straightforward but i think one of the at a previous meeting or one of the previous meetings we talked about you know at the trucks coming in because they're going to come in off 135 and then go down um 85 right from uh, 495 through, through the chair yeah is it possible maybe elaine could just let them know our uh, bylaws for the hours of operation because every week or two i always read about somebody we, we're, we're well aware of them, and, okay. and, and we've already committed to both the state and okay. um, in discussions with the town that we would work within the existing town's bylaws uh, 7 to 5, 30, Monday through Pretty Friday, close. and then seven Saturday, seven, seven, Monday 7 to 7, yeah. Monday through, oh, cut myself short there, <laughs> 7 to 7, Monday through Friday, and then Sunday, uh, Mon Saturday, Saturday it's a little shorter, I think. Uh, but we would be fully complying with those. Um, we're probably fine on hours of operation then, right? <clears throat> I think the hours of operation were fine. I think my only question was the, um, I think we talked about the trucks coming in. So, so truck traffic, the, the intention, I think there's really, there's two routes, but I think the primary route it would be off of 495 down 135 to the intersection of Route 85, at which point they would take, I guess, that left-hand turn left -hand onto turn. Route 85 yeah. uh, to Legacy Farm North, so Rafferty Road, where they would take a right. Um, up to Wilson Street, um, 
where they would take a right and then enter the site through the existing gate. Now I think as we had talked about the secondary access road, if it's amenable, we may use that access road uh, during construction. Yeah. Um, probably would benefit uh, Wilson Street just being the congested road that it is. Um, you know, Jerry, just a quick yeah. question. Would the, I think this is what you wanted to ask. Would the trucks follow the 7 to 7 time frame as well that we be delivering? In general, yes, there would be no offloading of trucks outside of those hours. Um, uh, it would be difficult for me to commit to the idea that a truck driver wouldn't individually be trying to get off the road and, and, and drive to the site and then be waiting at the gate when, when the crews show up. But we've already discussed that. We have that within um, uh, some of the the, the documents that are between the contractor and, and their subcontractors for trucking that they're not to be waiting idling on the streets or, or in the local area. Um, it's a little difficult to enforce with them, but in general, it would be within the, the, the same hours of the, of the work. Makes sense, and I don't think there's many houses, there, I don't think there's any houses within the range that the running truck would bother. No, I mean, there's just a lot of volume there. Yeah. We, we would certainly take them onto the site if okay. that was to take place, but the, the point was we don't want them queued up on the sure. roadway waiting to get onto the site and creating sure, other that issues. Sense. Yeah, that's, that, that's fair. And then we're talking about 40 trucks a day, approximately? Uh, for a short, well, for... That was for the short period of time, for about weeks. six weeks Doesn't say so. four to six weeks? Isn't that the... Yeah, and, and that's a, dependent on the amount of material that's on site um, versus that what? needs to either be brought to site or removed from site. And again, I think we discussed we're trying to mitigate that. To and we will do that. We have a huge mitigation of traffic issue during rush hours, and I'm just wondering, is there any way, is there, has there been a containment of the, or change of the hours of operation so that they're coming at 10 and leaving by two? Um, is that something that is even controllable or, or requestable? Uh, I, I can tell you we have, so we did do <coughs> traffic analysis with us, um, actually one of their sub uh, engineering groups. And so we do um, have those traffic volumes on the surrounding streets, particularly the intersection of 85 and 135. So we have, uh, we have worked with our contractor to do their best to avoid those hours for most deliveries. Now, I think it'll be difficult for us to avoid um, when they're doing, say, like a concrete pour and they need the continuous flow of trucks. But in general, for normal deliveries, they'll be trying to avoid the peak hours um, at the intersection. I don't recall exactly what they were, but it was maybe seven to eight in the morning and then again at five to six o'clock in the evening. So well, it's we've tried more to like, It's actually more like three. You know, we, we, we when school gets out, when school gets, gets out, out, we're dealing, you know, they yeah, deal with children traffic and um, 4.45 to 5.45 were the peak hours at the, the intersection. Now, we, we also have discussed with them, there's the school hours um, during the school year. Um, the timing of this project, as things kind of get kicked off, we're hoping to be kind of moving out of the school year for a lot of this peak traffic. Um, there will Summertime. be always deliveries throughout the duration of the project, but a lot of that civil work would happen as the school season starts to, to potentially wind down. So, just, you, Did you say 40 yeah. trucks a day for six weeks? Um, yes. That's like the maximum? I think that's the worst case scenario, right? If that, for, did I get it right? For the earth moving Earth process. moving piece. Yep. And then post that, post the earth moving, does that shrink considerably? Or is it if you're not trucking? I, I want to say it goes down to, that was 40 per day, right? Yeah, that was it, it goes down to. Elaine, Elaine, is there any kind of um, compensation or requirement for the usage of roads as far as wear and tear and that kind of thing? Because um, we all as taxpayers pay quite a bit for the use of the roads. And I'm just wondering if an individual company is using high volume, heavy trucks, are our roads going to be able to handle that? And has there been any kind of decision before where that's been weighed in? Well, it's a public way. <clears throat> so you can't prevent them from, from using it. Mm -hmm. But it's something that I suppose the DPW could discuss with them if there was a concern. I noticed one of the draft conditions says a photographic survey of local roadways will be taken prior to and upon completion. I assume that that was for that reason, in case there was excessive wear and tear. Okay. I I think we would propose, uh, certainly we've discussed and, and would like to survey 
like Rafferty Road, where we, or Legacy Farm North, where we'd expect there to be a lot of truck traffic yeah. from, from our project specifically. Now, you have the work taking place at Legacy Farms, and if you were to go up there today, there's quite a bit of heavy yeah. equipment up there, and I think that road specifically is in not great condition. So we would certainly want to survey that to, to kind of identify the as-found conditions of it. Um, and we've discussed, you know, having a third-party engineering firm do that. Um, I think outside of the um, the uh, close proximity to the facility, that becomes a little bit more challenging. I mean, when we did the traffic surveys, um, our 40 trucks make up about uh, a very small percentage of the, I think, 15,000 vehicles that pass through that intersection on a daily basis. So it's, it becomes more challenging for us to determine how much of an impact we really play in that. But but certainly local to uh, the site, we, we have the intention of surveying the Wilson Wilson Street and Rafferty Road. I think, I think, think the most at risk streets. I think I think you're right. Yeah, straight up. Yeah. Agreed. Question, just a question for Carol. How many trucks do you think are going down Chamberlain Street right now? I'm waiting for the phone to Gabe. <laughs> what? <laughs> More than 40. All right. Um, any other questions on hours of operation? All right. So we'll go with what is um, outlined in the um, conditions. Um, construction mitigation. Is there anything on the docket, Tracy, Jim, on construction mitigation for the project? Now that would be everything from dust to um, noise. We, we do have an address with the state, actually both of those topics, um, as far as um, nuisance noise, impact in neighbors, that type of thing during construction. Now again, we'll, we've committed to using the hours that are defined in the town's bylaws. But beyond that, if there were to be noise complaints from uh, neighbors, we have procedures in place with the contractor on how those would be addressed. So those wouldn't go just un, you know, uh, uh, unresponded to. So uh, both our community relations group and then also the contractor and the project group would, would address those immediately, whether that was to try to identify the source of the noise and what we can do to mitigate that for, for the future. Yeah. The other question would be a coordination issue for Elaine would be, would we be able to get them the information of any other road projects that are going on in, in, in the way, in their, in their path um, next year when they're planning the project so that there's you know, no conflict of interest of use of roads and... Um. So, may I? The, one suggestion I might have for that, and I, and I know we've worked, you know, we've been discussing this project and, and closely coordinating with the fire department f for quite a while on this. Um, we've discussed having um, regular reporting with them as far as construction status and activities taking place on site, I, I suppose it would be up to the department if they're willing to support this. But I know in just a recent meeting it brought up that there's, I think, a sewer water, uh, a water main replacement on one on 85 that'll be taking place this spring. So uh, I'm not sure who the, if that's the right department or there's another department in the town that we should be coordinating that, but I would suggest yeah. perhaps you that might be the right it. place to, to kind of have that type of touching point with each other to make sure that if there's or the police department as well, because they supervise any construction. That well, DPW to coordinate, they'll know when construction will be occurring, be their contractors be doing the work. So perhaps maybe um, w within our reporting with the fire department, we can place in there a section about traffic, off-site traffic type impacts, and um, at least we can make it aware to them that we're that we're aware of it, but then we can coordinate, I guess, maybe with the DPW or, or others to kind of populate that section of the report. Chief, do you want to comment on that? Does that make sense to, from your perspective? It does make sense, and the police department kind of tends to be the hub with public safety dispatch for any road and stuff, so I think we just add them to the dialogue and to the cover. Got it. And in a perfect world, Jim, when would this project start and when would it finish? <laughs> May of 2018. Um, um, most likely it would begin um, sometime this early spring. Okay. Um, we'll probably, um, 
I'm making a, a lot of assumptions here regarding the state's permitting process, but um, most likely we would expect to start after the winter, um, the real deep winter months, and so perhaps a little bit of work in March. Again, we're, our goal would kind of be to stretch out that construction time frame so that we don't have so much impacts, but um, it, it would likely be no earlier than, say, March, and most likely in the April, end of April, May time frame. And when would it approximately finish? Um, about 16 months after that. So it would be, I think, October of 2020, sometime around. I mean, is it a phased approach? Are you kind of doing phase one, phase two on it, or is it just, no, here's the project plan, there's different swim lanes that you're kind it's of managing It's pretty through. much a rolling kind of project execution plan. So um, we'll start with the site clearing, roll into the civil, then we'll start some of the structural and piping. Um, you'll kind of have, a, I guess, a little bit of a bell curve of as far as staff on site and activities. Um, probably the bulk of it being maybe six to seven months into this construction. I, I think most of the trucking is actually really up within the first the three months. End, right? And then the, the folks on site doing work kind of populate around the third to seventh or ninth month. So that's kind of the flow of the project, I guess, if that. I ask if, if Elaine knows if the downtown corridor project will be overlapping. Um, I was thinking about that. No. Okay. no. It's, not, it's not that close. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions on construction mitigation from board members? Um, let's get through uh, all the detailed discussion. Truck and access routes for the earth removal operations. I think we've kind of talked about that. Is it all going to be kind of, is it all coming off 495 to 135 to 85? Or is there any that would other? be the primary. Um, there is another route which would be going all the way up 85 to, I guess that's the Milford connection to 495. Um, yes. There's some bridge weight restrictions that direction, so we that and it it goes by um, the high school and others. So it's not our primary route. In fact, I would expect there'd be very little traffic along that route related to our job. Maybe you know, UPS and kind of smaller delivery type vehicles, maybe. Yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, the majority of it's going to come the other way. All right, uh, D, waiver for the earth removal bylaw, 100-foot buffer strip of undisturbed land. So um, typically a project like this wouldn't be in front of you for a separate special permit for earth removal because it's for a construction project for a facility. Um, so uh, we are maintaining the 75-foot no-touch zone, which is a zoning requirement. So we're maintaining the 75-foot of vegetated um, <coughs> buffer around the site, except for, again, the front of the site where there's already development there. Um, so we're, we're minimizing and minimizing the work as much as possible within the 100 feet, but um, there is some of the stormwater basin that will be within 100 feet from the property line on the west side of the site, and then on the east side of the site at um, at Wilson Street. I mean, we're working in previously disturbed areas there. Would you could you just show us on the map? The, sure. Where are you requesting the waiver? side of the property so the east of the north side of the property where there is any is there um, except for perhaps one of those arborvitaes or two of those yeah, arborvitaes we, we might be hitting some of the arborvitaes that are located you know so as you're entering to, for those of you who came to the site yeah. visit to the trailers there's, there's a row of arborvitae uh, to the left as you enter yes. so some of those will be removed because we need to smooth out the curve for trucks coming into this uh, relocated scale in the gatehouse at the entrance um, but you're right, there's nothing, you know, we're not extending anything to the north or the south of the site, you know, we won't be within the 100 foot um, buffer zones there, right, so here's, here's where there's some work occurring with um, 
where there are trees currently over at um, the Wilson end of the site. But, but again, those, those are not natural trees or uh, vegetation. That's all you know, previously planned by the facility. And we did provide a, for, the, for the, that east side of the facility on Wilson Road, we did provide to the state and have intentions of replanting um, a fair bit um, uh, more screening in that area. So we'll be increasing the screening. That was going to be my question. Are you going to facility. replant or, or kind of, okay. And on the west side of the site, um, so here's the existing fence line, and that's located about 75 feet from the western uh, property line. So within the 100 feet, there's going to be some grading associated with the infiltration basin. And who's the abutter on that? DCR. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So. Who's DTR? Department, uh, Department of Conservation. Department. Department. It's nothing. State Park. Yeah. It's, there's nothing there. Right. So it's not going to be. Um, cool. Any other questions on that in terms of what they're going to be looking for on the um, waiver? Just an interesting side note that that's a town general bylaw, not even a zoning bylaw, that earth removal. So, how far away is that from the um, existing older spillway? You, um, you mean for for the, the old the, the pond? Yeah, 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 that's, that's probably close to that, about 1,500 feet. The, the impoundment is up here, so we're we're on the other end of the site. So we're, we're nowhere near it, and, and none of this is going anywhere near the the impoundment. Oh, okay. So it's, it's a DCR land that you're butting up, and that's the 75 feet. That, that's oh, correct. okay, got it. Yeah, so, so it. Our, uh, our infiltration basin is being proposed down in this location. Here's the impoundment up here. What, what just um, to that question, what is the state of the DCR lands, and are they being, have you had a conversation with them about that? Uh, we have not. Uh, this is all just. Is it wetlands? No. no. Well, we're not even, we're not impacting I mean, we, we it. Did, yeah, we're not impacting their, their We won't be impacting now. it at all. No, no, we're um, at the closest, we're 75 feet from their property line. It's just that we'll be doing some grading for the infiltrate, and that's, that's the zoning requirement is to maintain 75 feet, and we're doing that across. Um, but for the earth removal, there's a 100 foot requirement, and we are doing some work to install the intent infiltration basin within that, I'll say, inner 25 feet uh, from the property line, below that 100 feet. Okay. Through the chair, do you think this is a good breaking point since I, we got through all the I, I do. discussion? I, I do. It's kind of late, and I think this is perfect. Kind of cut it off here unless there's any other questions from board members. Um, so <clears throat> um, a couple things. Elaine, when can we potentially get them on, or Colby? <laughs> Everything goes to December 3rd. That'd be December 20th. Um, and then I, I do want to, is it December 17th? Kobe, is that the? It's wide open on the 17th? That is wide open. 7.30? Unless you want to put a little bit of time aside for something else. 7.45. Yes. 7.45. And then um, on that, that, that testing piece, Jim, Elaine, I don't know if we need to, Coordinate uh, the board of health person for for these guys, or mm -hmm. okay, and just that might go. I think uh, the takeaway was that they would get us the details, and then the frequency would be figured out later. Right? Yeah, they can kind of work on that. Anyway. Any other questions? Questions for the group before we um, we um, close the public hearing? Continue the public hearing. <laughs> also, an extension of time to finalize. Ah. So we need to kind of uh, two weeks past the 17th, um, which would be the 31st. Get it all done before the end of the year. <laughs> you guys have the whole year. <laughs> New Year's Eve. So I'll entertain a motion to continue the public hearing to December 17th at 745, and then to extend the decision date to uh, December 31st. So moved. Moved or a second. All right, any discussion? All those in favor? One discussion. One discussion? Does that, uh, does that work for the... So work for you guys. 
Thank you, Jim. That works for us. Tracy? Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, good call. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Abstain? Motion passes. Thank you very much. We are moving forward, folks. We're moving forward. Um, all right. Any other business here? Sign the plans. Yes. Sign the plans. We have to sign the plans. Uh, yes. Uh, do we want to uh, entertain a motion to try sign the plans before we close the meeting or can we close the meeting? We close and then sign. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to close the meeting so for. Second. Second. Boom, boom, boom. All those in favor? Aye. 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 It passes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your patience.